It all started when I woke up to the sound of someone hammering on my apartment door. That was the first fright I got that night, heart pounding my chest as I grabbed the bat I kept under my bed and headed towards the door. First thing I do is look through the peephole to make sure it's not anyone sketchy, but I'm greeted by the sight of one of my neighbors. She looks terrified. She's covered in blood, and I can see just through the peephole that her face is a mess. I open up the door. She runs inside and immediately says, You gotta get me out of here. My boyfriend's trying to kill me. I start to ask her what happened, and she says something like, There's no time. Just please get me out of here. I swear to God, he'll kill you too for just helping me. That was what sent me into a straight up panic. Because if a guy was willing to beat his girlfriend up that badly, Lord knows that he'd be willing to put me in the ground. I just grabbed my car keys, ran downstairs with the girl following close behind, jumped into my car, then took off into the night. I remember asking her if she had anywhere I could take her, like a friend's or a relative's or something. She said no, and the best thing for us to do would be to drive to a motel so she could call the cops from there. So that's exactly what I did. I drove us to a motel and booked us a room. The clerk was obviously just as concerned as I was, but all it took was to explain that her boyfriend had tried to off her, and they were like, jeez, make sure you guys call the cops at least. The girl, whose name I didn't know at that point, I just knew she was a neighbor, said that she'd go up to the room and call them, then asked me to get her some ice from the ice machine so she could deal with the swelling on her face. When I got to the room, she said the cops would be there ASAP, took the ice, put it on her face, then just burst into tears. I tried my best to reassure her, telling her she was safe and stuff, then when she finally calmed down, I asked her what actually happened back at her apartment. She told me her boyfriend was abusive, and that she'd been planning on leaving for a while, but that night was the night she'd finally got the courage to gather to announce it to him. She said he walked into their bedroom to find her packing a bag, and not long after that, everything went to chaos. She started helping herself to the little bottle of liquor from the mini bar, but not after promising she'd pay me back for them once everything had blown over. I had no reason to disbelieve her at the time. I mean, I felt like we had a kind of bond established already, but I abstained because I thought I'd be driving back to the apartment pretty soon. I asked her if she was good to wait on her own while the cops drove out to her, but she asked me if I'd stay to keep her safe. She then made the point that if her boyfriend found the blood on my apartment door, she assured me that she'd left some on there while hammering on it, that he'd know she'd been there and he'd try to attack me, or worse. I'll be honest, I thought it was a pretty good point at the time. I hadn't seen the blood myself, but she was so covered in it that I believed her when she said that there was some on my door. Anyway, about an hour goes by and the cops still haven't showed up, and the motel rooms were arranged in a horseshoe shape so we'd have seen them rolling into the parking lot if they had. I asked her to call them back to see what was going on, because obviously it was a really urgent situation, and I know that there was basically no way for the boyfriend in finding us, but I was still really paranoid that he would somehow. That's when the inconsistency started, because she gave me some lame duck of a reply like, I'm sure they'll be here soon. If that was me, I'd have called 911 again if they hadn't shown up within like 10 minutes. So what was she so calm about that she was just cool with waiting for them for like an hour at that point? I put it down to booze and at that point I was okay with waiting too. It wasn't like I had anywhere to be. I sure couldn't just go back to my apartment with that psycho supposedly just a few doors down. But that's also about the same time that I started checking out the amount of blood on her nightshirt. She had like an oversized t-shirt and girl boxers on and like I said earlier, they were drenched with blood. But also with some blood splatter too, like little spots here and there. She had this cut over her eye and she had a nasty busted lip but it looked like way too much blood for just those small wounds. So I asked her if she had any other kind of injuries, like an abdominal wound of some kind that might account for all the blood on her. She said no, and that it was all from the busted lip in her eye. And immediately I start smelling nonsense. I asked her again what exactly had happened back at the apartment and she started getting weirdly defensive about what she told me. I was starting to think it wasn't quite the abusive spouse kind of story that she told me the first time around, but I had no inkling of what was really going on. 
That being said, I was getting tired of waiting for the cops to show, so I decided to call them back myself. All I had on me was my wallet, my phone, and my car keys, the only three things I'd had time to stuff into the pockets of my shorts before fleeing the apartment. But when I take my phone out to call the cops, she says something along the lines of, What are you doing? I state the obvious, I'm about to call the cops back, and she's like, don't. I don't know if it was the way she was looking at me, the way she spoke, or the way she sort of tensed up when I told her that I was about to do that, but the mood in the room just shifted completely. I asked her why not, then just went right back to dialing 911. But by the time the operator spoke down the line, I looked up and saw she had a knife in her hand. She just said, hang up now. So I did. I never had a knife pulled on me at that point, and I can't overstate how terrifying it was. It wasn't even just the knife either. It was the overwhelming creepy sensation of knowing that all wasn't what it seemed. I wasn't hiding from the threat. I was with the threat. I'll be honest here. I basically begged her not to hurt me, and to my relief she said she wouldn't as long as I drove her to the Canadian border. Given this was in Detroit, the border isn't all that far, but I didn't want to catch charges for aiding and abetting or whatever, so I knew I had to think of something to stop that from happening. It's not like I knew I couldn't tell the cops that I'd been threatened or whatever, but I also knew that the longer I spent in this girl's company, the more chances I'd have of being stabbed. So, I tell the girl that I drive her to the border, but that I needed to get something to eat first. I play it like I wanted to stop somewhere on the way, knowing she'd reason me down to getting something delivered from a 24-hour joint. She also stated that she'd be the one going down to pick the food up, as she didn't want me having the chance to sound the alarm. That's where she messed up, because she didn't seem to realize, to my infinite relief, that I could order from DoorDash and put something in the notes about needing the cops called to the motel. My whole plan hinged on there being a driver around that late at night, but Thank God there was, and I was even able to show her the order without bringing up the notes section that mentioned needing 911 call to the motel. And the cops played it perfectly too. They showed up without any lights and sirens on, didn't park in the lot, walked up to the motel room without being spotted from the window, then just knocked on the door like they were a delivery driver. She walks over, opens up the door, then boom, they had a gun and a taser drawn on her before she even knew what was happening. She had the knife tucked into the back of her girl boxers, but the cops were wise to her drawing on them, and she hit the floor hard after they hit her with a taser. Turned out they'd been looking for her because, get this, she was the abusive partner who'd stabbed her boyfriend almost to death before finding some poor schmuck, i.e. me, to drive her to the border. Dude almost bled to death in their apartment but managed to crawl to another neighbor's place to get help. You should have seen the amount of blood in the hallway when I got back to my apartment building and the whole place was crawling with cops and forensic gear. I thought I might be able to drive over to a friend's place to stay the night, you know, contaminating a crime scene or whatever, but they had this section of the corridor closed off so I could actually get into where I lived. The cops came to my apartment in the morning to take my statement down and to fill me in on what they thought had happened. That's how I found out exactly what the deal was. It was 100% the craziest, most frightening thing that's ever happened to me, ever, in my life. And just the fact that I was part of it seems completely surreal to me. But the thing that sticks with me is how easily I swallowed her nonsense story at first. How I thought it was helping someone I knew, someone I could trust. When in reality, one wrong move, and I might not actually be around to tell you this. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance and enjoy the rest of the video. I used to work at a motel that everyone said was haunted. I must have been there for maybe six or seven months, and I hadn't seen anything of the sort. 
Granted, I don't believe in any of that kind of stuff, so it's not like I was out there with my spookometer, but one night, I had a little run-in with someone that had me questioning my stance on the supernatural altogether. So at this particular motel, we had what was basically an on-site diner that was just across from the rooms and everything is single story. One afternoon, we were expecting two elderly sisters to check in for a few nights. These two sisters just so happened to be friends of the owners and fairly regular guests who came to stay on the owner's dime maybe two or three times a year. Only, I hadn't met them yet, so I had no idea what they looked like or anything. It was way past dark when they arrived, so while they're being greeted by the owner and their baggage is being unloaded by some of the other staff, I get the nod to head up to their room with a bottle of complimentary wine. So, I head to the bar in the on-site diner, grab a bottle of our best wine, two glasses and a tray, then head out of the back door of the diner and around to the back of the motel. This is a pretty crucial part of the story as I'd been told the wine had to be a surprise. They'd never have accepted it otherwise and the owner wanted a little showmanship for his friends, or more accurately, to make it look like he'd bothered to put some effort into it prior to their arrival. Either way, it meant that I didn't see the old ladies arrive, otherwise this story basically would never have happened. There's basically no one else around, and right after I put the wine into the motel room, I head out intending on scurrying away from the room so that the ladies don't catch me having planted their little gift. Only the opposite way I was due to head, I noticed one of the hallway lights was flickering. I swear to god, it was seriously like something out of a horror movie because I turned to look and underneath the flickering light, wearing a long, flowing dress, is a headless figure. At this point, it's important to note something about this whole dumb story about the ghost haunting the motel. Legend has it that it was a hung woman whose body had gone undiscovered for so long that she'd rotted to the point where her neck basically tore apart from the rot and the strain. Therefore, it was a headless ghost that was haunting the motel. I know that's about the lamest ghost story you've ever heard of, right? But then imagine being me, seeing that headless figure standing under the flickering light, and you can imagine why my heart went from zero to sixty as I looked at something that I had absolutely zero explanation for. I think I gasped so loud and so much that my lungs felt like they were about to burst, and that caused the figure in front of me to turn around. Okay. It wasn't a ghost, like I said. There's no such thing as ghosts or spirits or anything of that nature. But there is such a thing as osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition that severely weakens the bones of people who suffer with it. And in older folks, it can mean that they end up with some pretty painful hunching postures. Or in this old lady's case, bones so weak that she could barely support her own head. This meant that from behind... It basically looked like this poor old lady had no head at all. Anyway, she turns around, gives me this look as if she'd horribly been offended by my terrified gasp, and I'm forced to explain it away like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you, you startled me. She just frowns, points up at the light, and says something snarky like, better get that fixed, young man, then waddles off along the corridor. I felt like a total idiot. I seriously thought that I was looking at the very same ghost whose existence I've been denying for months on end. I can't even lie, it was one of the scariest and creepiest moments I think I've ever experienced. So, I've been working as a janitor at the local high school for a few years now and it's one of the most easiest jobs I've been on. It wasn't a big school as the town it was in was relatively small, so I was the only janitor working the night shifts. Most of my duties would be to go from building to building, mopping floors and picking up trash. It was a chill job, but it could get a bit lonely from time to time. One night, I was called into work a bit later than usual as the other janitor stayed to make up extra hours he had requested. I took his spot once he had left and pretty soon I was the only one in the building. It was a Monday night if I remember correctly and I was doing my usual nightly routine of mopping the hallways when I hear the sound of a door slamming closed. 
My initial thought was that the door stopper I had placed to keep it open had somehow gotten moved and I go over to see what it was. I could vaguely remember closing every door in this floor, so I was surprised that I had forgotten to close one. I go to the classroom where I heard the noise and peek my head inside expecting to find the stopper on the floor. Sure enough, the door stopper was on the floor and that's when I noticed something else by one of the metal cabinets. It only took me a good second to realize that there was a finger wrapped around it. Because of the angle, I didn't see who was hiding behind there and I sure as hell didn't want to know. I locked the door and didn't spend another second in there and practically ran outside the building calling security. When they showed up, I led them to the room where I saw the person hiding. However, by the time we got there, there was nobody inside and the window was left wide open. The whole ordeal didn't make any sense as we were on the third floor which was about 40 feet from the ground so there was no way he would have survived a fall like that. The security guard gave me an annoyed type of look as if he didn't believe me. I explained what I saw to my girlfriend but instead of believing me she went on to lecture me about how I wasn't getting enough sleep. Looking back now, I don't blame her, but I know what I saw. A few days later, one of the janitors was working the night shift as I had called in sick that day. He was mopping the floors of the second building when he found a dirty homeless man inside one of the storage closets. The man attacked him with a large butcher knife causing a truckload of blood to spill. Thankfully, there was an officer on standby and must have heard the commotion from upstairs. Long story short, the cop teases the man and was obviously arrested. Thankfully, the other gender had survived but had to have several stitches done. I still don't know as to how the man had managed to get in the school without being caught. School security was pretty strict about letting outsiders in unless it was a parent or something. I worked that job for another month after and never saw anything abnormal again. When I was about 19 or so, I got my first ever real job working at a gas station during the spring. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was enough to get my foot through the door to start making payments for college and stuff. I lived by myself in a small one bedroom apartment that my parents paid for, but got the job in the meantime to cover other expenses. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of night shifts knowing I had a 7am class every morning. It was annoying to say the least, but I really needed the money. During the night shift, you'd have people constantly come in and out for gas, and right around the 10pm mark, business would be slow for the most part. After that, you'd maybe have one or two shady people come in once an hour for a snack or cigarettes. That being said, it's still a pretty good time where I could chill out for a few hours. One night, I was on my shift as usual and had just finished serving what I thought was the last customer for the night as I was about to end my shift. As I'm packing up and getting ready to leave, a car pulls up right in front of the store and a man gets out. He wore a stained white shirt and had a scruffy beard with messy hair. He walks right in and I greet him with a hello and ask if I could help him with anything. He completely ignores my question and walks over to the refrigerators and grabs a six pack of beer. I live in the south, so people like this were very common around here. I tell him his total and he then says something that made my skin crawl. Hey, you're really pretty. I love your hair. 
Laughing awkwardly, I tell him thanks and he proceeds to hand me a $10 bill, making sure our hands touched. I give him his change and tell him to have a good rest of his night and go on my phone, hoping he get the hint to leave me alone. He thankfully left and I waited for my coworker who was working after me to arrive so I could go home. However, he must have been running late because it was 10 minutes past his shift and I was getting a bit annoyed. 10 minutes turned into 20 and then eventually 30. As I was about to call him to see where he was, I then noticed someone hiding behind one of the gas pumps. It was a little hard to see, but because of the light, I could make it out to be the same man from earlier. I had no idea as to what he was doing, but I could tell that it clearly wasn't good. He then comes out from behind the pump and I see that he's clearly hiding something behind his back and I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I grabbed my keys and was headed out toward my car when I see him approach the front door giving me this unsettling look. It was a look of hatred and fury. Suddenly he pulls out a gun and proceeds to show it to me as if he wanted me to know that he was armed. At this point, I'm frantically dialing 911 on my phone, and he then shoots the lock and steps inside yelling at me while having me at gunpoint. He orders me to give him all the money in the register or he won't hesitate to pull the trigger. I take a few deep breaths and calmly hand him the money we had, and he then takes off down the road. I call the police while bawling my eyes out in fear and the operator tells me to stay on the line with her until an officer arrived. Thankfully, the guy never made it too far as police had managed to track him down. Turns out, this guy was wanted for sexual assault and murder. His victims were two family members, one of them being his wife, one widower, and two gas station employees. Just. Like. Me. The next day, I quit my job at that gas station and now work at my local supermarket. So this happened a little over two years ago. It was late 2016 and I just started my new job at a motel. It was low pay but I needed an office job as it was required for my training. One of my friends, Michael, got me this job. For a few days, I did training with the owner in the mornings, and for two nights, Michael trained me. Our job was the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. Nothing too exciting, just checking guests in and doing paperwork. My boss, who is the owner, went away with his wife on vacation for a week, which is attributed to the swift training I had to endure. So, it was my first night alone on the night shift. There was a monitor with security cameras around the motel's property and large glass windows all around the office building with a glass door and there was no night window like most motels have. It was fairly early in the night at about 1am. I was just doing my normal paperwork when a man walks in and asks if we have any rooms available. Usually if someone is sketchy, my boss has me lie and say no, but he seemed normal at the moment. However, we just had a meeting on customer satisfaction and our boss was really encouraging us to be more polite to guests. Without hesitation, I said, Uh, yes, of course, just for one? And he replies, yes. So I begin creating the reservation on the computer when I notice he starts swatting in the air and making spitting noises, as if he were being surrounded by flies. I tried to ignore it and as far as I was concerned it wasn't my business so I tried to check him into the room as quickly as possible. I give him his key and he's on his way. At this point in time, I could be described as very timid and had a lot going on in my personal life so I hope you could all understand my reaction to what happens next. The man comes back from his room and slams his hand on the glass door and causes me to jump. Absolutely frightened, I look up to see him just staring at me. He cracks the door and puts his head through and says, I can't get into my room. 
Why won't you let me into my room? My only defense is trying to be helpful, so I replied with, Oh, um, maybe there's something wrong with your key. Here, let me give you another one. The look he had in his eyes was inexplicable. I felt like I was in absolute danger. I handed him his new key and he went back to his room. I tried texting Michael because he was the one who trained me. Though it was in the middle of the night and he was asleep, I needed some guidance. With no reply from Michael, I noticed the man trudging down the stairs to come back and I go to absolute panic mode. I run into the back office and lock the door and I pull out my pocket knife. It's important to keep protection when working at night. All the while, I hear the man in the office yelling, Hello? Hello? Why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? Me being an absolute idiot and not sitting my ground and calling the police when I'm feeling scared, I decide to take the situation on alone. I reply with, I'm just on the phone. I'll be right out. I then start calling Michael over and over for help, but no answer. I decided to take a few deep breaths and then step out of the office. However, the man was not there, but rather in the bathroom. I start hearing him talking to himself, saying, Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. My heart sank. Still being an idiot and not calling the police, he comes out and I say, Oh, uh, your key was broken. I'm sorry. Let me escort you to your room. He agrees. Thankfully, I was wearing a long sleeve sweater, so with my arms down, I was able to hide my knife in my hand while holding it. I begin to walk outside, and he seemed insistent to walk behind me. We begin making our way to the staircase and up towards his room. I was sweating from how nervous I was, cautiously looking behind me to make sure he wasn't going to make a move. He stops at a room, and I stop at his room a few doors down, I smile, and I say, Oh, that's the wrong room. This is your room. As it clearly said on the door. The whole time, he was going to someone else's room trying to open the door. I quickly ran back to the office and locked the door. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a few towns away. I felt bad for him about the guy, but they seemed willing to keep an eye out and ear out. The next night, the man came back but I had the doors locked and told him we were all booked up. I explained to my boss what happened when he got back from vacation. However, he didn't take me that seriously. I continued to work there on the night shift for the next year, where many other strange encounters happened. So, strange man, let's never meet again. If you ever feel uncomfortable, always call the police. September 4th of 1978 was an exciting day for Scott and Amy Fandel, as their aunt Kathy was coming to stay with them for a few days in their small Alaskan hometown. The children's father wasn't in the picture anymore, and their mother, Margaret, was not only looking forward to seeing her sister, she was greatly relieved to be getting some help around the house. Little did they know, their lives as they knew them were about to change forever. When Kathy arrived in the early evening, both she and Margaret took 13-year-old Scott and 8-year-old Amy down to a local bar and arcade named Good Time Charlie's, letting them binge on soda and video games until just before 10 p.m. When the two women announced their bedtime, the children protested, but eventually allowed themselves to be driven back to the small log cabin where they lived. However, Margaret and Kathy weren't quite ready to call it a night, and after dropping the kids back at the cabin, they decided to return to Good Time Charlie's to continue drinking. Shortly before departing, Margaret told her children not to stay up too late and that they'd be back sometime after midnight. Kathy then told Scott to lock the door once they'd departed and, in reply, Scott apparently laughed. It was later established that he laughed because the door's lock was broken, and despite his insistence that she have it fixed, his mother had neglected to do so. Once their mother and aunt were out of sight, the Fandel kids decided to sneak over to their neighbor's place, the Luptons, to play with their five kids. It's not clear what a bunch of kids were doing out so late on a Monday night, but 
One of the neighbor kids later reported that nothing seemed amiss with the Fandel kids who were happy and relaxed when they came over to visit. They stayed there until the noise got too loud, at which point the Lupton's mother emerged to corral her children indoors. She then shooed the Fandel children back to their cabin and told them to stay indoors. She later stated that she believed the children had obeyed her commands and returned to the cabin, and a passerby confirmed that lights were on at the Fandel place when they walked by at around 11.45 p.m. These lights were apparently switched off when Margaret and Aunt Kathy arrived home sometime between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. When they entered the cabin, they found a pot of water boiling on the stove. On a nearby countertop, a package of macaroni and a can of tomatoes lay untouched. The woman apparently took the pot of water off the stove before clearing away the food, but at no point sought out the children to chide them for doing something so dangerous without parental supervision. It was later implied that the women were so drunk that they didn't want the kids to see them in such a state. On top of that, Margaret was due into work at 8.30 a.m., so as much as we can understand why we might want to get as much sleep as possible, it still seems odd that neither of the women would check on the children. As we mentioned, Margaret awoke around 8 a.m. to begin her shift, but still didn't check on her children. Aunt Kathy said she slept until noon, and was the only one to check on the kids for around 12 hours. When she found they were absent from the cabin, she assumed they were at school, but the neighboring Lupton kids would later state that the Fandel kids, who they usually walked to school with, were nowhere to be seen that morning. When Margaret arrived at the restaurant she worked at, she apparently called her children's school, intending to scold her daughter for not checking in with her before she left for school. But school staff were forced to inform her that Neither of her children had shown up that day. Panicking, Margaret told her boss that her children were missing, and she needed to be excused from her shift so she could look for them. According to Margaret, her employer refused and demanded she work the rest of her shift. So, instead of looking for them herself, she says she was forced to rely on her sister to find them. It wasn't until 3 p.m. that day that Alaska State Troopers learned of the children's disappearance a full 15 hours after they'd last been seen. Upon inspection of the family's cabin, the police found no signs of any kind of struggle, but the fact there was still a pot of water on the boil when the women arrived home suggests Scott had been interrupted while cooking something. But if he'd walked outside the cabin with the stove still on, he'd obviously expected a return, so initially, the main theory was that the kids had been lured outside then snatched before they had a chance to get back inside. Naturally, one of the first suspects was Roger Fandel, the children's absent father. He lived all the way down in Arizona, but within a week, he had flown up to Alaska to help look for his kids. He cooperated fully with the police investigation and was subsequently ruled out as a suspect. Police established that Roger and Margaret's marriage had broken down due to alcohol abuse on Margaret's part and infidelity on Roger's, and at no point did police deem Roger a danger to the children's well-being. Yet Margaret and Kathy, as well as a handful of their blood relatives, seemed to insist that Roger was somehow responsible, given that his uncle Herman was a vocal proponent of taking the kids back by force. This uncle Herman was later questioned by police, and although he was honest about having said such melodramatic things, he too was cleared of responsibility. The police were so convinced Herman was lying that they actually dug up his backyard, but not a shred of evidence was found. One witness claimed to have seen a black sedan speeding away from the cabin in the middle of the night, with the driver and passenger being identified as two carnival workers. They were indeed working at the Alaska State Fair on the day the children went missing, and had moved on the next day, but it was later confirmed that Margaret had let the men stay at her home for a single night just a few weeks prior. They were mostly definitely aware of children and definitely had access to the children, yet despite remaining suspects, the two carnival workers were never fully charged with either kidnapping or murder. Following her children's disappearance, Margaret Fandell became deeply depressed, and this only exacerbated her problems with alcohol. Two years following her children's disappearance, Margaret left Alaska behind, abandoned the very place she had once sought solace in. 
Shortly after she left, the cabin she and the children lived in was burned down under mysterious circumstances. In 1980, Margaret remarried and sobered up, later stating that she prayed daily that the children would be found alive and well. Her ex-husband, on the other hand, firmly believes his children are deceased, saying that if they were still alive, then surely they'd have made an effort to contact him in the four decades since they disappeared. Margaret's brother Terry had made a handful of bizarrely specific claims since their disappearance, such as stating that Scott was murdered, but that Amy is somehow still alive. He's also stated that he believes her to be living in Anchorage, Lompoc, California, or Drummond in Montana. Terry has never fully explained why he believes his niece is living in such a specific place, and we're only left to imagine how he's come to such conclusions. Yet the question remains... What happened that caused the children to vanish that night that they were left alone? And if someone took them, who was it? One thing we have to keep in mind is that Scott Vandell was extremely protective of his little sister, with those close to the children saying he was Amy's devoted protector. If someone tried to take the girl, there's a very high chance that Scott would have put up a considerable amount of resistance, yet there was no evidence of such a struggle in the cabin. This suggests that the children left the cabin of their own volition, possibly enticed by someone they knew and trusted. There's also the little detail of the cabin's lights, which were apparently switched on at around 11.45, but switched off a few hours later when Margaret and Kathy returned from Good Time Charlie's. Like most children, Scott and Amy were said to be scared of the dark, so either they'd turn them off knowing they were unlikely to return, or someone else had done so. There's also the possibility that Scott and Amy simply walked off into the forest and died of hypothermia, but not a single shred of their remains had been found in the years that followed, and even if they'd succumbed to the cold and been eaten by wild animals, at least a few scraps of bone or clothing would have been left behind. So if someone actually visited the cabin and took the children, who might have the motive to do so? As we've already mentioned, the number one suspect would obviously be the children's biological father, Roger. One of the reasons Roger and Margaret's marriage had broken down was her excessive drinking, so there's a chance that Roger viewed her as an unfit mother and viewed their abduction as a kind of rescue. His surprise visit might have excited the children so much that they remembered to turn the lights out but forgot to turn off the stove, especially if their father told them they needed to leave as quickly as possible. But why would Roger resort to abduction over some kind of appeals process? Well, it came out years later that Roger wasn't actually Scott's biological father, only Amy's, so it's highly unlikely that he would have won any kind of custody battle. But how would Roger have known the children would be alone that night? Sure, he lived down in Arizona, but that doesn't mean he didn't travel up to Alaska surreptitiously, watching the cabin for the right time to make his move, before disappearing the children completely. And I do mean completely because if Scott and Amy are still alive, they'd be well into their 50s by now, having forged entirely new identities over the years, presumably with the help of their father. They'd have gone to school, maybe even college, started employment, maybe a family too, all without ever being detected. It's a plausible theory, but even saying it out loud brings it into disrepute. Sure, the kids might keep their mouths shut to spare their father any legal repercussions, but to remain totally incognito for 50-something years would be extremely difficult, and therefore highly unlikely. And so, we're forced to look elsewhere for the most probable explanation. Then, even as unlikely as it seems, we have to consider the possibility that Margaret and Kathy are responsible for the children's disappearance. The fact that Margaret claims she left her children home alone so she could carry on drinking shows just how reckless she was, even in a small town where she felt they were safe. What's more, Margaret's story is so inconsistent and nonsensical that it makes all the sense in the world to view her with suspicion. Drunk or sober, she completely neglected to check on her kids, either when she arrived home or before she left for work, then had the nerve to call Amy's school to scold her for not checking in. Then there's the issue of her boss refusing to let her leave work after finding out her children were missing. This never once had been corroborated and 
no matter how troublesome her financial situation was, the idea that a mother might be content to just sit and work while her kids were in danger is extremely doubtful. However, some say these same financial troubles motivated Margaret to sell her children into a black market adoption ring, and even that her second trip to Good Time Charlie's was an effort to gain some liquid courage for what was to come. That would definitely explain the lack of a struggle, and the complete lack of any evidence regarding their whereabouts almost completely rules out the possibility of them being killed by their mother or their aunt. Maybe one day we'll read a news story in which one of the Fandel children finally comes forward. Maybe we're only one regressive hypnosis session away from an internet breaking headline. But it seems more likely that the truth is Scott and Amy's disappearance will forever remain a mystery. And in the absence of any definitive explanation, we find ourselves considering the most cynical of possibilities. I'm a 15 year old male, I live in Germany, but I come from a small European country. This event had happened before I moved to Germany. In my country we have field trips, usually at the end of 8th grade, that last for a week or so. Now, I've had my fair share of stalkers, but nothing like this. It was September in 2014 and I went to a field trip on an island with my class. I was 14 at the time. There was this girl Jane. Jane used to be a normal girl up until that point. She was always kind of shy and really kept to herself, but everyone liked her. She was never bullied or anything, just a normal shy girl. We used to chat on Facebook a little bit, but nothing serious. I never really harbored any feelings towards her, neither in her favor nor against her. Now, back to the field trip. I've smoked a couple of cigarettes with my mates in our hotel room, and then we met outside. The teacher wanted to show us some plants that were specific for that area. Now, I've noticed that Jane was talking to me more often than before, and that she had walked very near to me, but I thought that that was merely a coincidence. I didn't make a fuss about it, but as time went by, things had started to get worse. She started touching me, hugging me, and following me, respectively. On the third day, we went on a cruise to a nearby island, and during the cruise, she was sitting next to me. She had a camera and was taking pictures of me. I had zero sense of restraint at that point since I was young and didn't think much of it. I've noticed that she was taking a suspicious amount of photos, mostly of me, and I told her to calm down. Then she talked to me for an hour, but she didn't say anything interesting. She was mimicking the Irish and British accents to me and basically blabbering stuff for approximately an hour. And I was just smiling and replying with, That's nice. In the following days, she had started to hug me and make me feel uncomfortable, so... One day I came to her and told her that we needed to talk in private. We went to the woods and I asked her if she was in love with me or something like that. She denied it and kept saying that there had been a misunderstanding, but I knew that there was something off about her. Then she told me her life story. She said that her mother is a schizophrenic and that she's severely depressed about it. I felt sorry for her, but still her and that touching was incredibly inappropriate. During our conversation, my mates wondered where I am and organized a search party for me. They found us eventually, but she had decided to stay behind and let me go. I have no idea what she was doing after I left. On one occasion, I'm a little fuzzy about the details, she came into our hotel room asking for water, as if there wasn't any water in her own room. However, when she got the requested water, she refused to leave the room. We got rid of her by telling her that we were going out to have some fun. The next day, the harassing got even worse. She would follow me around and hug me. The peak of her abnormal behavior happened in the evening. I took a walk with a friend of mine and turned around briefly only to see her behind us. She was following us, I kid you not. I have never felt this kind of dread in my whole life. We have made our way down the shore and I hid behind a big rock next to a police station. We should go inside and tell the police we have a stalker, my friend joked. Anyway, she couldn't find us and gave up finally. My best friend heard the story and went to her room to tell her to screw off. I was infuriated with him because it was rude of him, regardless of her actions. I'm usually not meek, but I thought that was horrible. Now I see that no matter how cruel that was, it was the right thing to do. I went to her room and apologized for my friend's actions. She was in her bed sobbing uncontrollably, and I calmed her down and went outside. 
A female friend of mine, Sarah, had invited me to come to her room so we could discuss something. I made my way to her room and saw two other girls there. We sat in the chairs in her balcony and she had told me that Jane is a very depressed person who had done some self-harming in the past. I was shocked when I had heard that. So, amidst our conversation, I winced. I raised my look and saw Jane, maybe 50 meters or 160 feet away, just sitting on a rock, listening to music and staring at me. She had a solemn look in her eyes. I suddenly felt dismay and told my friends that we have a spectator. They winced too and we decided to pry on her a little bit before backing out to the bedroom. Just stay away from her, was the last thing Sarah told me before I left. To my luck, it was the end of our field trip and I finally got some rest. Weird encounters with her became fewer and fewer because she was often absent from school. Later I found out that she had overdosed on sleeping pills a couple of times but survived all of those occurrences. There was even a rumor that she had ended up in a psychiatric institution but I have no proof of that and I can't tell you in confidence. The point of the story is that sometimes you have to be rude so you can prevent something like this from happening to you. It may seem cruel or it might even hurt the other person but in the end, it's your life and you have to stand up for yourself and make sure that you're happy first. This happened to me some time ago, back when I was 10. On a field trip to a group of cabins some 70 kilometers or so from the city I lived in. The point of the trip was basically just to have fun. We weren't being taught much other than how to make shelters and light a fire in the rain. For the most part, we were supposed to spend the majority of the time just fooling around, playing tag and swimming in the nearby lake, and maybe playing board games inside the cabins when it was pouring outside. Things turned out to be less fun, at least during the first two days. At first the trip seemed great. We got to choose our own roommates, there were four rooms in each of the four cabins, and my group of friends and I obviously chose one together. There were four of us in total, myself, an Indian guy, a Canadian, this happened in Canada, and a Chinese guy. Neither of us had ever been on a trip like this before, so far from home and in the middle of a mountainous forest. When we got there, we took a tour which was led by the camp's coordinator, this twenty-something year old with shoulder-length blonde hair. He showed us the cabins, the lakes, the trails, and the kitchen and lunch rooms, and then stressed us that it was important that we not wander off far from the cabins since, being in a forest at the base of a mountain, the chances of getting lost were relatively high. So we finished the tour, ate dinner, and then we were guided to bed as we had arrived somewhat late. My friends and I were extremely excited, what with this being our first time sleeping away from home and everything. The Canadian friend had the, at the time, seemingly brilliant idea to share ghost stories while we got ready for bed. We each came up with a fictional character that would creep out kids or murder people or something. I came up with this idea of someone called Psycho who would hide behind the shower curtains and then stab you when you stepped inside. For the record, no one showered during the four days we were there. The Indian guy came up with this typical under the bed monster who would grab your legs as you got close to the bed frame and drag you under. As the hours passed and lights out drew closer, we started to get the creeps. By the time the lights out hit two hours later, we were so high strung with a combination of excitement and nerves that everyone, excluding me, decided to share one bed even though there were two of them. The Indian guy's story about the grabbing your ankles and being dragged under the bed monster unnerved us to the point that we jumped onto the beds from nearby pieces of furniture rather than have to walk near the bottoms. As I mentioned previously, I decided to sleep on my own because three people in one bed, even ten years old, was awkward and this being summer, it was hot. We talked for a bit before turning off the lights and falling asleep, but I was awoken some hours later by what sounded like whispering. I didn't move at first since the stories we had shared while getting ready for bed were still in my mind. And then I recognized the voices and realized my friends were the ones whispering from over on the other side of the room in their bed. So I relaxed for a moment and I was about to call out and ask what they were discussing when the Indian guy, apparently unaware that I had woken up, hissed, What's it doing? Immediately, the thought of some monster looming over my bed took to my mind and I froze eyes darting around in the darkness. I didn't see anything, as the room was empty and it was too dark to make out the distinctive forms of my friends in the other bed. It's looking at him, 
said the Chinese guy, and then added, Do you think it will break the window? And then I looked at the window. It was one of those floor-to-ceiling ones with a latch that opened up to a balcony. Standing in the balcony, pressed up against the glass, was the silhouette of a person. The curtains were drawn, but they were white and thin, and we could still see the warped shadow of the person, illuminated from behind by the dim light of the moon. The man, it was almost certainly a man, was holding a long pole with a wide end, similar to a sludge hammer or even an axe. I whispered, Guys? The man outside didn't move, but the Chinese guy did. I didn't know how he even worked up the courage to do this, but he crawled out of bed and slowly worked his way to the side of the window, duck low, all commando style. He reached forwards, grabbing the curtains, and was about to peek between the fabric when the man outside knocked on the glass. The poor Chinese friend jumped so badly that he pulled hard on the curtain, causing the entire thing to rip off the railing letting us see the person outside. He was dressed in black, aside from a pair of orange shorts, and had a ski mask on. What he held in his hands was actually a shovel, rather than a hammer or axe. Nevertheless, the four of us were terrified. The Chinese guy screamed and bolted for the door, and in less than a second, the four of us were scrambling at a bed and hightailing it for the exit, screaming all the while. My Indian friend tripped along the way, and the Chinese friend was in such a rush that he slammed into the door, causing the lock to nearly snap. In seconds, we were in the cabin's lobby, and everyone else was rushing out of their rooms to see what had happened, teacher included. She had her own room. We told the teacher, in terrified gasps, what had happened, and she went to investigate, but found nothing. The person had disappeared. After that, it took about an hour before we were convinced to even step back into our room, I clambered into bed with my friends despite their protests, and we stayed awake for the remaining four hours or so, hands clutched around our flashlights. The curtains remained open. The next day passed normally, and though we talked about the event, we soon forgot ourselves in the blur of activities that the camp council had set for us. We ate lunch, fooled around, ate dinner, and then, with no small amount of dread, walked back to the cabins and got ready for bed. The same guy actually came back, but to a different cabin this time. When we woke up and headed for breakfast hall, a group of girls were talking about the man with the shovel, and after talking with them for a bit, we realized that they had experienced the same thing as us. We were just about to go to the teacher and explain that there was someone out there trying to murder us little kids when the camp's coordinator, a 20-something with blonde hair, walked into the breakfast hall wearing the exact same orange shorts the man outside of our balcony had been wearing. He denied everything when our group questioned him, and we didn't dare take the matter to the other camp counselors or even our teachers. The rest of the trip was uneventful, but judging by the shorts, it was almost definitely him. At the time, it freaked me out to think that one of the camp's counselors was doing this sort of thing. We suspected him for murder and a whole host of other things, but looking back at the trip... He was probably just a bored young adult trying to make an otherwise repetitive job as a counselor more exciting. Still, I hate to think about how depraved he must have been to scare ten-year-olds in that way, possibly leaving them with trauma or emotional scarring. It was the summer of 2013, and I was on a field trip with my summer camp to a water park in West Palm Beach, Florida. I was 14 at the time, and the whole purpose of this trip was for our end of camp activity. It was a relatively large water park with water slides, a lazy river, and lots of other water activities. When we got there, our camp counselors had told us that we could split up in groups, but to check back at the meetup spot every three hours. My friends and I had went on to do our own thing while making sure to stay together as this place was huge. Fast forward about an hour later, two of my friends wanted to go on a water slide that I couldn't go on due to my size. I'm a big guy, 6'4 and weigh about 200 pounds and this water park took heights and weights very seriously. As I'm waiting at the bottom, I notice a man talking with a young boy who looked to be around 6 or 7 who I assumed was his son. 
In that moment, I didn't think anything of it until he immediately said something that caught me off guard. Oh, I just so happen to have some ice cream in my car. Let's go get some. At that point, I found myself looking toward their direction and they both walk off with him grabbing the kid's hand. Thankfully, my friends had just gotten out and I told them everything I had just witnessed. With Alex being the oldest and a camp counselor assistant, he runs after the man and grabs him by the arm pulling him down. However, the fight was over within seconds with Alex giving him blows to the head. Security had come and told everyone to back away. They then of course arrested the man and took him to the front entrance where police would be. Thankfully, the boy's mother had come back and was crying her eyes out. Turns out, the mother had left him there while her and her older daughter went onto the ride as he was too young to ride. She was apparently also charged with leaving her child like that and wasn't sure what happened with her daughter. I still give Alex credit for stepping into a situation like that as when he sees something, he says something. This took place when I was around 23 years old, back in 2014. I used to work as a summer camp counselor at a Jewish community center in Florida. I was one of the counselors for a younger group of kids, and oftentimes the camp would take about two field trips a week to various places. Whether that be the aquarium, a water park, or even the beach, it would always be something fun and entertaining for all the campers and staff. One day, our group was going to the Museum of Science, which basically consisted of solar systems, planets, marine animals, and other cool attractions. Our supervisor told every counselor to take a separate group of kids and take them around the museum, but to meet back every hour. I mean, the place is huge, so it was no big surprise that we had to meet up. Anyway, I had been assigned to take four kids from the group and keep a close eye on them as we explored different sections of the museum. For privacy reasons, I'll call the kids Michael, Jay, Cynthia, and Samantha. We stopped at the marine exhibits, looked at some animals, and I even let the kids play in the kinetic sand pit they had. These kids were in the 6 to 9 age range, so I let them have their fun with me helping them once in a while. After about 45 minutes, we were in the astronomy section when I did a head count of all the kids and realized one of the kids had been missing. The missing child being Jay. I quietly cussed to myself and looked around asking the others where the hell Jay went. Samantha spoke up first and said that he went with the pirate to go find the treasure. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach as she said this, and I immediately call our supervisor to explain the situation. As I'm talking on the phone with him, I see a very tall man grabbing Jay by the arm in another room. From the looks of it, Jay was clearly uncomfortable and terrified. Thankfully, my supervisor had come along with the police. The police had placed the man in handcuffs and brought him over to Jay to ask him if he knew this man. He didn't. The man was arrested and was placed in prison for God knows how long. Apparently, the police had searched this man's house and found tons of illegal pornography on his computer and had a history of pedophilia. I got fired from my job after that incident, even when I took responsibility, and I now work at a store in a shopping mall. Back in high school, I used to be part of the honors classes. I'm sure by now most of you know what honors is, but for those of you who don't, it's basically special courses for higher achieved level students. Basically, the smartest of the smart. Now, I'm not sure how other schools do it, but my school had several field trips planned throughout the year. One of them involved going to the Stanley Hotel, which is said to be one of the most haunted hotels in America. 
On top of that, it was also featured in the hit 1980 movie, The Shining. I never really believed in the paranormal. I thought the whole thing was BS just so people can get views for fabricated videos. This trip was for our history class, and with our teacher being super into this kind of stuff, he didn't hesitate. When we got there, the tour guide gave us a small tour of the main lobby and gave us info on the hotel's history. About 10 minutes into the tour, I began to get bored and remember wandering off into this other room to look around. In this room, laid a piano surrounded by those red ropes you'd see indicating that it was just for display. I, for some reason, found this piano amusing, which is weird considering the fact that I was never into music. I get a little closer, and right then, I hear clear as day, a single keynote from the piano. I jump back in shock, figuring that it might have been a chord or something that snapped from the inside. It was at that point when I noticed an older man in the room with me. He nods his head at me indicating that he heard it too, which made my skin curl. I remember getting out of that room as soon as I could, and the second I did, I heard what sounded like crumbling of falling bricks. This whole section had walls made out of them, but all of the bricks in the walls were intact, meaning that there was no damage, so I wasn't sure as to where the sound was coming from. I hurried back to the tour, not telling anyone about what I had just heard. We finished the tour, and after it was done, I went up to the tour guide and decided to tell him. He had this shocked look on his face and told me a story about a hotel maid that used to work here. She had died about 20 years ago in this hotel and loved the piano, which guests claimed to have heard. I have never believed in the paranormal, but I have no other explanation for this. This happened to me when I was in first grade, so about six or seven years old. I am now in my mid-twenties. Every year, the first graders take a trip to the zoo, about an hour away from our town. I was a shy little girl, so I spent most of the bus ride staring out the window while the other kids were busy conversing with each other. A jeep pulls up where I have a clear look into the vehicle and at the driver. We were on the interstate. I am seeing him playing with something under his shirt all the while looking at me and then back at the road, back at me and so forth, one hand on the wheel and the other fiddling with whatever was under his shirt. I couldn't keep my eyes off of him, fascinated about what he was hiding. And then he lifted his shirt, and yep, I got a good look at what he was playing with the whole time. He freaking waved at me. Granted, I was a little girl and had never seen one before, nor did I understand why he was doing what he was doing. A girl that was near me asked what I was looking at, and then she got to see for herself. She started hollering, and I swear to God, all the kids on the bus ran to the window to see what was going on. The jeep gunned off, and I'm sure it got off the next exit. I remember telling my mom about it when I got home, but then I just sort of blocked it out of my mind. It was only several years later when I had two daughters of my own that I recalled this event, and just last night I was talking to my mom about it, wishing that I had been more mature and had thought to get his license plate number or something. All I remember is that it was a Jeep or SUV of some type and some middle-aged white guy. I just hope and pray to God that I, nor any other child in their life, ever has to go through or see something like that again. This took place back in 2016 when I was a junior in high school. I was around 17, which is the typical age for an average junior. Our class was going on a day field trip to a nearby wooded area by a lake to learn about some plants and study them. It was for our earth science class and the objective was to use the so-called skills we learned in class to identify which plants were which. It was kind of like a scavenger hunt, and the group with the most plants found got extra credit or something. Our teacher allowed us to split up, and my friend Colin and I wandered off to go explore. 
We had found one bizarre looking plant and identified it as a passion flower, a common plant native to Florida. We continue our walk and eventually come to a clearing full of grass that was about knee high. From there on, we had identified two other plants that we were supposed to find and after about an hour of playing Pokemon Go, we decided to head back. It was around 5.30 and the sun was starting to set and the bus would be leaving at 6, meaning we had to get back soon. So there we are, walking through the thick brush when Colin stops me dead in my tracks and shushes me. Dude, do you hear that? Upon the crickets chirping, I listened closely and heard the sound of what I thought was crying. It was coming from the left, about maybe 25 feet away, deeper into the woods. Colin, being the invested person he was, decided to go see what it was. Figuring that it might have been another student in need of help, I decided to go along. We walked through the thick brush with twigs and branches hitting our faces the further we went. The closer we went through, the more clear the crying got. By now, the sun was almost set and we had to turn on our flashlights from our phones to light our way. Suddenly, Colin stops and puts his arm in front of me and tells me that it was coming from behind one of the trees. He points to a large tree about a few feet away and the crying was clearer than ever. I tell him that we shouldn't go over there and that something didn't feel right. Colin, being the tough guy he was, ignored my advice and walked over while I made my way back to the bus. Not even 30 seconds later, I hear Colin scream at the top of his lungs. I see Colin come running toward me, grabbing onto my hand and bolting it to the bus. All the while, I'm trying to question him while we practically ran for our lives, but he wouldn't answer me. As we were running, we could have sworn we heard something from behind us, but we genuinely didn't care. We thankfully made it back to the bus, just in time, hyperventilating. There were a few students who looked concerned, but we refused to reveal anything fearing we'd get into trouble. Throughout the bus ride home, I tried every attempt to convince him to tell me what he saw, but he gave no response. From that point forward, we didn't mention anything about this to anyone, even our parents. Colin and I are still friends and are now both in our last semester of college. Till this day... Colin still refuses to tell me as to what it was he saw, and I'm not sure if I'll ever know. Sometimes I'll look back on that day and think about going back to the lake to try and listen for the crying again, but I'm not sure I want to. For a very short period of my life, I want to say it was around the time I was the age of 15 or 16, I lived in a fairly small house in Vermont. My family didn't live there long. It was located in the forest and far from almost everything, making any task that required leaving the house pretty inconvenient. However, there's one experience I had at that house in the time I lived there that I'll likely never forget. It happened in January. I only remember that because I can recall New Year's Day being just a few days earlier. My cousin Jason and I were both still on school break at the time and had planned to spend the night at my place. This was something we would often do. We would typically stay up till 2 or 3 a.m. playing Xbox, watching movies, or something along those lines. This would all happen in the living room. This night, we had been watching a movie. I don't remember what movie it was, but that's not important. What I do remember is being maybe halfway through the movie when Jason kept looking out the window just slightly to the right of where we were sitting. It got to the point where, like every minute, I could see his head move out of the corner of my eye. Now, I should mention, on that night, there was a fairly bad snowstorm happening. At first, I just thought he had been watching the snowfall, until I realized just how long he had been staring out the window for. I asked him what he was looking at. He kept staring, and responded saying how he thought he saw something. This instantly filled me with anxiety. I think this was mostly due to where we lived. Wild animals weren't all that common, 
and like I mentioned earlier, we didn't really live near anything. So, someone on our property, especially at this hour and during a snowstorm, would 100% be cause for concern. Nothing happened for a couple minutes. I kept asking follow-up questions, but he just told me to be quiet, like as if to be able to focus. That's when we saw it. The clear shadow of a person sprinting from one tree to the next. Both of us physically jumped in reaction. There was no sound, but the sheer sight alone was enough to startle us. Now, this was a good 200 feet out from the house, so we couldn't exactly tell if the person was coming closer or not. We both looked at each other, and right back out the window, I guess as a way to confirm what we just saw. A couple minutes of this went by, when it happened again, but this time much further to the left of where the first sighting had occurred. Slowly over time, the sightings would become more frequent. It was clear by this point that there was more than just one person. Eventually, one of the figures got out from behind a tree, but this time, instead of moving behind another one, it just stood there. And after a couple seconds, the figure started sprinting in our direction. This was enough to break us out of our sort of trance of disbelief we were in and run. I ran straight upstairs to wake up my dad, but by the time he got up and followed me downstairs, there was no one visible outside. Jason and I both explained to him what we had seen. Typically, I don't think my dad would have believed us, but I guess he was able to see the genuine panic in our eyes. We all went around the house, verifying all the doors and windows were locked. My dad then went outside armed with a weapon. He briefly walked around the house before returning inside, but he found nothing. That night, we convinced my dad to fall asleep in the living room with us. Come morning, and the snowstorm had almost completely stopped. We went outside to better assess the situation in the daylight, and we would find multiple sets of footprints in the snow next to the trees facing our living room's window. They were pretty filled in from the snowstorm, but still clearly visible and recognizable as footprints. There were even some around the house, like on top of the footprints my dad had made the night before. I even talked to my dad about it, and he said those had not been there when he went outside. Even more disturbing, was how our shed had been left completely open, with the only thing stolen being our knives we used for hunting. None of this, however, would be enough to get my dad to call the cops. He always had this, we take care of our own mentality, and I guess he just never saw calling 911 as an option. We moved out of that house two weeks later. Not because of the incident, rather that just so happened to be when we had planned to move. I was extremely grateful for this. At least as far as I know, Nothing happened in those two weeks. This whole experience still freaks me out to this day. Seeing firsthand multiple people on your isolated property in the middle of the night and during a snowstorm is straight out of a nightmare. And I do my best not to think about it. This happened when I was about 13 years old. One weekend, my parents and I were out of town for work. So I was staying with a friend who lived across the street. Every morning I would wake up and go let the dogs out feed them, and clean the litter box. Then my friend and I would go play for the rest of the day, sporadically checking on the house. One morning my friend and I woke up very early, still dark out, and looked across the street at my house. Our electric garage kept opening and closing all by itself, constantly. And one of my dogs runs out of the garage. I ran out and grabbed the dog. Then we watched the house for about 5 minutes before we decided to walk across the street to check on it, thinking it was a glitch. We walk into the garage where I push the button to make it stop. Now to explain my house, you walk into an entryway, and then the house is split level. You can go upstairs or downstairs. We walk upstairs flipping on the lights and looking around, and there's nothing. Then we begin to walk downstairs towards the basement. As I flip on the stairwell light, which has a dimmer on it, we see a shadow on the wall quickly move away from the bottom of the staircase towards the other side of the basement. My friend and I freak out and run out of the back door to my friend's house, where we wake her parents who call the cops. They come and search the house. Nothing inside. However, they do find footprints in the snow all over the back deck, which wasn't shoveled, and the back door was found unlocked. Nothing was missing as far as we could tell, so I cannot imagine what he wanted. I didn't step foot into the house again until my parents came back home, 
and even then, I basically had to be bribed, not to mention my room was down in the basement. I slept in my parents' room for two weeks after that. <laughs> kind of funny thinking back on it, a teenager sleeping on the floor of their parents' bedroom. Number 2 When I was a kid, I was living with my grandma in an apartment complex in a very poor area. It was a really bad neighborhood, but my granny and I were living in the nicer part, which really isn't saying much. The apartment complex was really small, three floors and 12 apartments all in all. But as the neighborhood wasn't exactly friendly, neither were the neighbors. We hardly knew anyone in the complex, People were constantly moving in and out before you even had a chance at saying hello. But then again, the few people we did say hello to were either creeps or criminals. I don't think we were missing out on much. The complex had a huge basement, and each apartment had their own room in the basement. The basement also had a laundry room. The entire basement was creepy as fuck, but it was really quiet down there most of the time but anything going on in the complex would eventually manifest into sounds in the basement. On top of that, the heater, which was also down there too, was always making this sound like a dying cat, and every pipe and floorboard down there was really creaky. As a young child, my granny didn't allow me to go down there on my own. Not that I ever wanted to. Even before this particular incident, plenty of bad stuff had happened down there. People would often use the basement for illegal activities or to store drugs. A lot of people would move away without cleaning out their rooms, leaving behind the stuff to be found by the landlord. One time the landlord found a meth lab. Another time he found a batch of dead dogs, which apparently had been alive when the resident of the room had been living in the complex, but had starved to death once he had moved out. Anyways, I was 14 when I was first allowed down in the basement on my own. My grandma was getting old, and I was taking over more and more responsibilities at home. Doing laundry was always my biggest terror. Yet, as time went by, I got more used to the sounds and the creaks down there. The basement was just a tiny bit less creepy. When I was 15, my grandma had won a new dining room table. Being the old-fashioned hoarder she was, she didn't want to part with her old set, instead she wanted it down in our basement room, which of course rested on my shoulders. I went down to our basement with a few chairs, and then into our room. That was when I first heard the noise. The reason I noticed it was that it was unlike any of the noises I usually heard down there. It was repetitive and seemed to have a pattern to it, not like the other noises, which seemed to be random. The noise was strong in our room, but not outside of it, like someone was knocking on the walls in the room next to ours. I put my ear to the wall, trying to figure out where the noise was coming from. I remember thinking that perhaps it was rats or pests running around inside the walls. Like that, the pattern was even more obvious. Three short knocks, then three long knocks followed by three more short knocks. I immediately had the feeling like I heard that pattern before, but couldn't quite put my finger on why. I went back up to my grandma and asked her about it. She reminded me that it was Morris Code for SOS, which she had taught me a long time ago. I told her I heard it down in the basement, and she went down there with me to investigate. When she heard it too, she called the police. Well, the police showed up with the landlord, then had each resident open their basement room. The residents that weren't home, or otherwise unavailable, had their basement rooms kicked open. In one of the rooms, the police found one of those big old-fashioned closets. Think of the one from the first Narnia movie. Inside, they found a young woman who had been abused, starved, and pretty much tortured. The owner of the room was an elderly man, who was living in the apartment above ours. As it turns out, she had been down there for at least five days. 
and while a lot of other people had apparently heard the noise, no one else had recognized it as an SOS signal. I'm a male, and I was 22 when this story occurred. The encounter happened when I moved back to my hometown after graduating. At first, I had moved back in with my parents, until I found a job. At first, it was great seeing more of my parents, as I hadn't seen them much studying in a different city. But the novelty soon started to wear off, and I was missing the independence I had living in my own apartment when I was away. I found a job a few months after, and decided I was going to find my own place and regain my independence. I began searching online, and was looking at both letting agencies and private landlords, scoping around for places that were within my budget. I had gone for a few viewings that I turned down, as they weren't what I was looking for. This is when it happened. I came across an ad online for a place with a great location within my budget. The ad had contact details for Alan, with a standard looking email address. I emailed Alan and found out the place is still available. I'm psyched and arranged a viewing. Alan doesn't work or live in the town and won't be able to meet me before 7 p.m. No problem. We can both do it the next night. So I show up to the address. It looks just like the photos from the outside. I'm getting more and more excited and I can't believe my luck. I knock on the door and a large man opens. I'm six foot one, 190 pounds, and this guy was towering over me, easily 6'4". He almost looks disappointed as he extends his hand. I'm Andy. The name was Alan on the ad. Not a red flag yet. Could just be he doesn't like advertising his real name. As I shake his hand, I say my name. He responds, I thought you would be a girl. I have a unisex name. At this point, I'm assuming he prefers girls, as they tend to be tidier than guys. I say, don't worry, I'm quite OCD with my living space. I like to keep it clean. He just sort of nods, still looking disappointed, but as if he's trying to hide it. He seems uninterested as he shows me around the place. I actually really love it so far, but anytime I show my interest, he seems to be trying to put me off. For example, I said I love the big windows, and he responds with telling me that they can be drafty sometimes. Just small things like that. I'm still brushing this off as him thinking I won't be as clean as a female tenant. We finish looking around the place and I tell him I'm really interested in renting, but first, I want to see the basement. It was advertised with spacious basement in the listing. He then states that there is no basement. I just look at him confused and point out it's stated on the ad and there's a door in the apartment that he didn't open during the tour, which I'm assuming is the basement entrance. He's beginning to act a bit sketchy and says he's reconsidering including the basement and that he might be just using it for storage instead. The basement was a big positive for me on the ad as I pictured man caving it or throwing parties down there with friends. As the apartment is in my budget, I say I would really like to see the basement, and if I liked it, we could possibly work something out, like me paying more to include the space with the rent. He seems unsure, but as I'm being adamant, he finally relents and says he will show me, but first he has to go down and tidy up. At this point, I'm reconsidering hanging around, as it seems like a red flag, but at the same time, he said he was going to use it for storage so I figured it might be a bit messy down there. So I decide to wait. Andy disappears into the dark basement. I'm waiting for a light to flicker on when he reaches the bottom of the stairs, but it stays dark, and I hear some shuffling around for a minute or so, and then the light comes on, and he shouts up that I can come down. I begin to get this really uneasy feeling, and I'm considering leaving, but I brush it off because I do still really dig this apartment. I head down the stairs and reach the turn near the bottom. When Andy perks up, watch your feet. That's when I look down and notice it. There's a thin line of that plastic kind of clear wire stretched across the stairs. You know, the kind that's used for washing lines. It runs across about ankle height, right before the bend, and tied around the ends and secured by screws. 
He sees the what the fuck look on my face and quickly chimes in that the last tenant had a dog and he painted models or something down there. The wire was there to keep the dog out and he hasn't had a chance to remove it yet. Pretty flimsy excuse considering the ad said no pets. I'm thinking the only reason he didn't remove it was because I was at the top of the stairs and I would have seen. Obviously at this point alarm bells are ringing so I don't wander far from the bottom of the stairs. And he says, well here it is. And a minute later is quickly trying to usher me back up the stairs. Relieved, all I see down there is boxes and a tied up bin liner. Typical storage stuff. No weird smell or anything. Just a normal looking basement. But then I notice it in the corner, just as I turn to go back upstairs. There's an old mattress poorly propped up in the far corner, with a sheet covering it. But you can see the bottom corner, and it's clear what it is. It looked like he tried to hide it with a sheet, but couldn't see in the dark. We head back upstairs, me leading, and I remember to step over the wire. Andy immediately closes the door. We'll get in touch if you want the place, and maybe we can work something out with the basement. He's acting super sketchy at this point, and I can tell he wants me out right away. So I say, Sure, it's a lovely place. I'll be in touch. Nice meeting you. Then I'm quickly ushered out. I called my best friend when I left and told him what happened, and that Andy might be planning on luring a girl down there and tripping her on the stairs to do God knows what. He says maybe I'm being paranoid, but it does sound sketchy as fuck. I decide better safe than sorry and call the police station on the non-emergency number and explain to them what happened. The police thank me and say they'll check it out, but they really don't sound sincere. I expect to hear a follow-up. I called back about a week later to inquire, and they told me they can't release any information. But I keep an eye on the local news, and nothing comes up that sounds like Andy. The ad did get removed the next day, though. Maybe I put him off the idea. Maybe it was me being paranoid, and maybe there was nothing malicious afoot. Or maybe Andy followed through with his plan and was never caught. A couple of years ago, after graduating from college and living in an apartment for a couple of years, I finally bought my first house. It was sort of small but had two floors and a basement. I got a pretty good deal on it because it needed a little bit of work, but over the first few months, I got a lot of improvements done. Anyways, one day after work, I was going down to the basement to do some laundry. The basement was mainly unfinished, but I did have some extra furniture and a few boxes down there. As I was passing by the main room of the basement to the laundry room, I thought I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I stopped in place and looked over. Then I leaned down to get a better look. When I could get a better angle, I saw that there was a man hiding underneath a table that I had sitting in the basement. I must have been frozen in shock because it took me several seconds to believe that there was actually some random guy in my basement. The man made eye contact with me and then he moved. He got up from underneath the table and ran into a nearby room. The next thing I knew, all of the lights went out and I couldn't see anything at all. I figured he messed with the fuse boxes down there and switched them off or something. I literally couldn't see anything at all. And unfortunately for me, I had left my phone upstairs charging and couldn't use anything as a flashlight. I was probably about 15 or 20 feet away from the stairs, and I wanted to get out of the basement as soon as I could. I started to slowly walk in what I thought was the direction of the stairs. It was very quiet down there. Then I heard noises of moving coming from a ways away, but I couldn't tell exactly where. I didn't know who this guy was in the basement with me, or how he got in my house but I was terrified at him possibly being dangerous. I quietly moved a bit faster towards the stairs, and when I thought I would be getting to the steps, I tripped on something and fell down. When I did, I heard more movement. This time, it sounded like the guy was closer to me. I decided to crawl to the stairs, and I constantly felt around for the steps. Soon I was able to find them, and I began crawling up the stairs on my hands and knees. At last, I felt myself reach the door to the upstairs, then I began to stand up to open the handle. When I did, I felt my right ankle suddenly get grabbed. 
Whoever it was had grabbed my leg and pulled me back to the ground. Then we started to go back down the stairs. As this happened, I desperately kicked my legs around as fast as I could. I could feel the man grabbing at my legs and trying to get closer to me. I could feel the man grabbing at my legs trying to pull me down. I was able to get one really good kick in and it seemed to get him in the head. I felt his grip loosen and I quickly kicked away and stood back up, then opened the door. I wasted no time in shutting the door behind me and running to grab my phone. Then I ran out the back door to the house and called the police. I didn't stop running until I was off of my property and in the street. The police said they would have someone there within a few minutes. I continued to move away from the house though because I didn't want to take a chance on seeing the man again. I didn't even care if he left. When the police arrived, sure enough the man was gone and my front door was left open. I don't know how the man got in my house or what he was doing down there, but those were probably some of the scariest moments of my life that day. I was very careful to always lock my doors after that, and I only lived in that house for a few more months before moving. This story happened many years ago when I was a kid. If I had to guess, I'd say I was maybe 12 years old. My family lived in a pretty average house in a big neighborhood. We had one level and then a basement. I was always kind of scared of the basement because I was a kid and it would usually be dark down there. Overall, it just seemed scary to me. We didn't really use the basement much for anything other than storage though. We did have a little setup of an old couch and a couple of chairs with a TV though, but it was only used occasionally. One night when my parents were gone, it was just my older brother and me at home. I had to go down to the basement to get something, and as I opened the door to the dark basement, I was immediately a little bit scared. I ignored the feeling though, and turned on the light and then walked downstairs. I went down there and noticed that something looked different. As I got closer, I saw that all the furniture that was set up in the basement had been rearranged. It was as if someone had moved everything to the other side of the room. It wasn't really messed up, but just rearranged. I was startled and ran back upstairs. I asked my brother if he had rearranged things in the basement, and he shook his head and told me no. I told him to come downstairs and look with me, so we both went downstairs and saw how everything was rearranged differently. My brother told me that he had just been down there the day before, and it wasn't like that. We both agreed how it was really strange, but knew our parents must have done it. When they got back home later that night, we asked them, but to our surprise, they said they hadn't moved anything at all. We all went back downstairs once again. When we did, everything was back to normal. All the furniture and everything was just how it had been before. My dad went around and looked everywhere and said everything seemed to be perfectly in place. Nothing else like that ever happened and my family only lived there one more year before moving. Still to this day though, I always wondered what exactly happened down there. A few years ago when I was in high school, I used to get home and play video games almost every day. I mainly played video games in the basement where we had a pretty big TV and I wouldn't bother my parents who liked to watch TV upstairs when they got home from work. Our house was a split level and our basement wasn't really below the ground. Well I guess half of it kind of was in the front, but in the back of the house we had a sliding glass door that opened up to the backyard. One day when I got home from school, I immediately went to the basement to play video games like always. Right away, I noticed that the sliding glass door was open just a little bit. I could feel the cool air blowing inside. I went over and shut it and immediately wondered who had left the door open because I knew that I hadn't. Then I went to the couch and started gaming. I played video games until my parents got home and called me up for dinner. I ate with them and then did homework in my room and then went to bed. I had forgotten all about the door being left open downstairs and didn't even mention it to my parents. The next day though, when I got home from school, the door in the basement was open once again, but this time it was much wider. I also noticed that quite a few things in the basement appeared to be messed up. I got a bad feeling and ran upstairs and called my parents. They told me to call the police, so I did and then waited for them to arrive. When they got there, they searched the entire house and property but nobody was found. It seemed there had been someone in our basement, but they had left that morning. I was glad they were gone, 
but it was really creepy to realize that whoever was in our basement was likely in our house with us all night. Last year, my husband and I decided to clean out our attic, which was in our two-story home. It was long overdue, and none of us had been up there in over a year. The attic wasn't very big, and neither of us used it. However, we did have some things up there that had been stored up there for years. We finally decided that the space could be put to better use. We both went up there one Saturday morning and looked inside. There were a few boxes and old pieces of furniture. It really wasn't that bad. We grabbed a couple of boxes and brought them down. I asked my husband to go through one of the boxes because it was mainly his things in there. Then I went back up to get some more. When I went back up, I got a couple more boxes. But as I was up there, I thought that I heard a noise come from the back corner of the attic. I looked, but I saw nothing. Nevertheless, I was pretty freaked out and ran back downstairs. My husband asked me what the problem was, and I told him I heard a noise up there. We both decided to go back up together and investigate. When we got up there, everything seemed normal, and I walked over to the corner where I had heard the noise. My husband followed to look, but just then, we both heard a noise from directly behind us where the door was. We turned around at the same time to see the door to the attic being slammed shut. It was so fast I didn't see who had shut the door, but it was now closed. My husband and I both looked at each other in shock. Who just did that, he asked. He then walked over to the door to open it but the doorknob had been broken off from the inside. We both tried to get out, but couldn't seem to open the door with no knob on it. We heard some movement throughout the rest of our house as we did. It was very creepy, and luckily we did have our phones on us, so I decided to call the police. My husband then put a large piece of furniture in front of the door, so whoever was in our house could at least not get back in the attic where we were. I explained the situation to the police, and they said they would arrive shortly. We waited and looked out our window as well as listened to hear for more noises in the rest of our house. We didn't really hear anything more though as we waited. We looked around the attic but didn't see any evidence to indicate that someone had been up there. Several minutes later, we saw out the window the police arriving in our driveway and we waved out to them. They made their way into the house and up to the attic when they opened the door for us. They told us whoever had been in our house was now gone. Our back door had been left open and they didn't find anybody inside. Whoever it was didn't appear to take anything or mess up the house at all, which was a little bit surprising to me. We were able to finish cleaning out the attic and replace the doorknob in the days after. We didn't know how the person got into our attic in the first place or what they wanted, but I also found it creepy how they knew to remove the doorknob so we couldn't get out. This story happened last spring. I was doing some spring cleaning in my house like I did every year. As soon as the weather would get warm, I would organize through things and then have a big yard sale. I went through many things around the house and then took out several boxes of things we were selling outside because it was such a nice day out. Once we had everything outside, we would organize it and decide how much we would charge for it at our yard sale. I was cleaning by myself on this day and went through quite a few things and had a decent number of boxes outside by the time I had been cleaning for a few hours. When I was on my way out to the driveway to put some more things out, I saw a man walking up my driveway and towards my garage. We had a detached garage which was open at the time, and I didn't recognize this man at all. It was really unusual for something like this to happen, and I called out to the man and asked him what he was doing. But he didn't answer me, he just kept walking until he was inside of my garage. Now I was a little bit worried, because we had tools and other things in there he could steal, or even use as a weapon. Still, I decided to follow the man inside and hope that he didn't have any bad intentions. Maybe he just thought he was at another house or something. I walked over to the garage and went inside. When I got inside, I couldn't find him. I walked all around, which wasn't that big, just a single car garage, and we didn't have a car in there at the time. I walked around it twice, but never saw the man. Other than the large garage door in front, we only had one other door in the back of the garage, but it was covered at the time by our old trash cans. I just didn't see how on earth the man could go and just seemingly disappear like that. I was a little bit spooked, and then went back and decided to bring the boxes just inside my house. 
I organized the rest of the things as usual, and on the next day set up for our yard sale. I planned to have part of the sale in our garage and the rest in our driveway. As I was setting up things in the garage, I couldn't help but feel a little creeped out by remembering the man who seemingly vanished in there the day before. The next day, we held our yard sale. I sat about midway down the driveway at a table and chair with a little cash register, and before long, people started to show up. Things were going well until one of the shoppers came up to me. She told me that there was a creepy man hiding in a garbage can in the garage. I decided to go over and look. I felt more brave with a few people being around, and when I got to the garbage can in the garage, I opened it up and saw the same man from before. He didn't look at me, but aggressively jumped out and sprinted away. Everyone seemed really surprised at what they had seen. I'm really glad the man didn't cause any major problems, but it's really creepy to think how he was likely in my garage for several days. Several years back, I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up, and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine, but when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sort of by the sink, and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw there was a small trap door to the side leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it, and I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house, and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me, and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully it never gave me a problem. Back when we moved into our house, we were introduced to all of our neighbors by them coming to our house with cookies or brownies kind of like they do in the movies. This was a nice, quiet, middle-class neighborhood made up of mostly older white people and new families. I mention that because we were the only black family in the neighborhood. No black wives, husbands, not even adopted children. We didn't really find it strange, though. It was just very clear that we were different. I was about 13 years old at the time, and my brother was 15. Our backyard was about a half an acre and is fenced, but it's also connected to two other houses' backyards. Each one is about half the size of ours, but we all have separating fences. So to paint a picture, there's a T-shaped fence separating our backyards. The house to the left was the home of an older man named Tom. He kind of reminded me of Willie Nelson, but without the cool pigtails. 
He liked to be outside shirtless and usually with a denim vest, no matter what the weather was. He was a pretty well-built man, but visibly kind of frail. We actually found him to be quite funny, in a creepy old guy type of way. As I got older, he had started to make comments. I played in the backyard with my dogs a lot, and Tom could see me in his living room window that faced his backyard. Whenever I glanced over, I could always see him in the window, just standing there watching me. When he noticed that I saw him, he'd come out and talk to me. I would try to get away before he would come out, but sometimes I was just too slow. I didn't want to make it too obvious, so I would just walk. But if I didn't make it inside, he'd yell for me to come back. I never got too close to the fence, though. I'd speak from a distance. He would ask me about school, what grade I was in, tell me I was pretty, and ask if I was old enough to have a boyfriend. Also, if I had an older sister or older friends that looked like me. It was pretty weird, but I'd just laugh it off. But after a few questions, he'd stop talking to me and just stare at me, silently. I would always give an excuse about needing to go inside, and he would nod and stand at the fence and just watch me walk back into the house. This kind of thing happened almost weekly. My mom really loves to decorate, so she changes the house decor every few months or so. It's pretty annoying, actually. During one of her designing sprees, she had decided to get a new sliding glass door for the back porch, which required her to take the curtains down in the living room. It took forever to get them installed, but she figured that there was no point in putting the curtains back up if we'd have to take them back down again. Fine, I guess. Now, our family TV was in the living room. I didn't have a TV in my room, so I'd often watch TV late into the night in the living room with my brother. One night, my brother went to bed pretty early, so I decided to watch TV by myself that night. Right around midnight or so, I had turned off the TV so I could go to bed. I got up from the couch, turned off the light, and then turned around to see another light on. Not in my house, but in Tom's house. It was in his living room, and he was there, just standing in the window watching me. I later told my parents about it, but they just shrugged it off. I'm a pretty anxious soul, so I often just chalk things up to my anxiety. Fine. Not too long afterwards, though, my dogs had started to get sick. I would take them out to play and they'd start throwing up or have diarrhea. We knew that it wasn't their food because we didn't give them anything new. We also threw away the dog treats that we recently bought just in case that was the problem. But it didn't stop. I had started to notice that every time I let them out alone, they'd always run straight over Tom's fence jumping up and down and wagging their tails. He would slowly walk outside, reach over the fence, and then feed them his treats, which was really odd because Tom didn't even have a dog. I told my parents, and my dad went to talk to him, telling him the dogs were getting sick. Tom had apologized, and he had also stopped feeding them, and they got better. A few weeks later, I was coming home from school. My brother was in the grade above me, and I was a senior, so he was in college at the time. Whenever I got home, no one else would be home for a few more hours. I had a routine. I would put my book bag downstairs, then change clothes, let the dogs out of their cages on the porch, get a snack, and then let them back in. For some strange reason, I was just unusually excited to see my dogs that day. So instead of going upstairs, I went straight to the back porch. I had got to the door to open it, and I then saw Tom just sitting on the ground right in front of the dog's cages. I froze. He didn't see me, though. I looked over to see if the door was locked, but it wasn't. I had began to lock it as slowly as possible so it didn't make a noise, but it did. Tom then looked over and he saw me standing there. I ran upstairs to go call my parents. My mom's a nurse, so she didn't have her phone on. And my dad, well, my dad just never answered the phone. I didn't really think that it was serious enough to call the police, so instead I just hid. After about a moment though, I had then heard Tom knock on the door. It wasn't loud or aggressive though. It was almost like friendly, like he just wanted to talk. I tried my dad's phone yet again and he then answered. I was crying hysterically and I had then told him that Tom was on the porch. He said he'd head home but he was about an hour away. 
I just sat in my room just waiting for my dad. The knocking stopped. All I remember was that my dad got home and Tom was gone. I don't really know what happened between Tom and my dad, but he did stop coming outside and talking to me. He never did stop watching though, always standing in his living room. Sometimes I'd see him through the window and he would wave at me, but always with the light on just so I knew that he was still there. It was pretty creepy. I'm a 21 year old female, so I just recently moved into my first apartment. My neighbors are all really nice. I was actually introduced to them the day I moved in about three weeks ago. One of my neighbors is this guy named Paul. Paul stays outside most of the time and he like always wants to talk. Now I'm not too social. I'm totally fine with talking to people and having long conversations. But when I'm at home, I really just want to be inside with my pets and watching X-Files. Paul always talks to me like every second that he has the chance, knocking on my door to ask me something or inviting me over to chat like last week. Soon after I moved in, Paul had gave me his Wi-Fi password so that I could use it for my TV. He asked me for my phone number to send the photo of his internet box because the password's just a bunch of numbers and letters all jumbled up. I gave him my number and it was whatever. We never sent any texts apart from that photo. Then today, I had got a series of texts, saying that I have a secret admirer and that he wants to stay anonymous until we see where things go. At first, I just ignore it. That is, until he then uses my name and then says, Talk to me, yes or no. So now I'm totally freaked out. I entertain the texts, answering simply and just trying to find out who it is. He asked me for my preferences, my type, and my age preference. Pretty mildly weird and unsettling since he absolutely refuses to tell me who he is. Later on in the text, he says that we should have a secret affair, not tell anyone. He says that he's in his 40s and that we should sleep together and that he'll always support me financially. There's only one person in their 40s that has my number. My neighbor. My neighbor Paul who's always outside talking to me any chance he gets and constantly staring at me. I tell him that I'm pretty positive that I know who he is, but he just insists that I don't. There's no coincidence in the fact that I got his text not even two weeks later after giving him my number. He says that he could have gotten it from a coworker. Now, I work in a hospital, but in my department there's only five guys, but not a single one of my coworkers even have my number. So anyway, yeah. Now I have a creepy neighbor who propositioned me for sex in return for money and I'm pretty much stuck here in a year lease, living about 10 feet away from him. So great. This event occurred when I was a child. I was around 8 years old at the time. My mom, my sister and I had just moved into a new apartment complex and we were really happy to finally have moved in and everything was going pretty fine. My younger sister and I would always play outside almost every day, and soon enough, we had met our neighbor. He was really nice to us and would often give us candy and ice cream, but always told us not to ever tell our mom, which at the time, I didn't really give much thought to. We would sit outside and eat whatever treat he had given us that day, and then he would collect our trash, which we thought was really nice of him. He would always stare at us with a really creepy smile on his face, and I remember feeling really uncomfortable with it. On one day, my family was getting ready to go somewhere, and while my mom was getting ready, my sister and I just went outside to play. After some time, we had heard a whisper coming from upstairs. It was our neighbor, and he was poking his head out of his front door. He then said, Hey girls, I've got some candy, but if you really want it, you're going to have to come up here to get it. My sister and I, being really naive children, got really excited, and we started to walk up the stairs to his apartment. While we ascended up the stairs, he had a really wild smile and a finger up to his mouth, like he was motioning us to be quiet. We were about halfway up the stairs when my mom then came out and told us to come back down. Then the man immediately closed his door. After that happened, my mom wouldn't let us go outside alone anymore, and our neighbor stopped talking to us completely. Looking back on this, I was so foolish to take things from a man that I barely even knew. If my mom wouldn't have called out to us, who knows what would have happened to me and my sister. 
not too long after we had moved to a different location, to that really creepy man that almost successfully lured us into his home. I'm really glad you didn't succeed. When I was 11, almost 12, there was this woman living above me that was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she had went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This happened in 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception than a rule, at least for my area. For a little context, I was home alone at the time while my mom was at work about a five minute walk away. My mom had let our neighbor and her boyfriend come to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and just let him in, bringing him into the living room which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits for a few seconds, then hangs up the phone. He does this a couple more times before the front door of the building then opens. Now, you can easily hear the front door open from where we were. It's a heavy door and the walls are really thin. And the way that our building is set up, it's a really small, old single family house converted into apartments. Me and my mom's apartment was the only one on the first floor, and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was literally the only one above us. Kind of irrelevant, but there was also a much smaller apartment below us. Anyways, my neighbor's boyfriend then looked at me, pointing his finger right up to his lips, as if he was trying to shush me or something. He then went on to tell me not to tell anyone he was there, before then speed walking to my room right at the other end of the apartment. I then watched my bedroom door then close, right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock right on the door. My jaw then dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. The cop had then asked me if my neighbor's boyfriend was there. Being really scared, I had stammered out, Yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, which I agreed to, and as he was coming in, he asked if I could let his partner in the back door and lead them to my room. We started to walk together to the back of the apartment so that I could let his partner in. Now, the back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. After I let them into my room, I had then watched as they then pulled my neighbor's boyfriend right out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, they had told me to go wait in the living room while they had then brought him to the back door. I walked back to the living room and after they closed the door, I couldn't really hear what they were saying but I could then hear the distinct sound of metal clicking and I quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still pretty scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked and locking the front door on my way out. I decided to head to my mom's work, now crying. I'm pretty sure I cut the five minute trip into about two minutes and I've never been a fast runner in my life. I was pretty much fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point and I just really wanted my mom. When I told her what happened, my mom was so pissed off that he had used me in the way that he did, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet of all places and trying to keep the cops from finding him there. She gave me a pretty short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone, telling me that I wasn't to let people use our phone even if I knew them unless she was home. I don't really want to know exactly what he was wanted for, nor do I want to know what would have happened if the cops hadn't shown up when they did. I live in a small studio apartment. I like my place a lot even though it has some details that always made me really nervous living here. The wall facing the street is basically just a giant window and I also live on the second floor so my window is very close to the streets below. The marquee looks very easily climbable and gives direct access to my window. Even though that makes me a little uncomfortable, nothing really ever happened and it just stopped bothering me a couple of months after I moved in. That is, until last week. Last Monday, I woke up at around 2 a.m. to go get some water to drink. Since the kitchen is right next to the side of my front door, I could hear something coming from the corridor as I filled up a cup. It wasn't coming from another apartment or from the streets. The noise had that very specific reverberation from an empty corridor. I approached the door and could make out that the sound was actually some kind of trap beat playing on repeat. 
At first, I thought maybe that, that was just some drunk guy messing around with his phone before getting to his apartment. But after laying in bed again, I could still faintly hear the same beat coming from the corridor. It kept playing and playing until I fell asleep about an hour later. 7 a.m. rolls around and I'm woken up by someone ringing the doorbell. It was a cop. A bunch of them, actually. The landlord and some of my neighbors were also there. Even with the place really crowded, it was really hard to miss the trail of blood that went from the corridor window to the far end of the wall. The cop said that someone was leaving for work early in the morning when they came across the blood smears and then immediately called the police. He questioned me and the neighbors. The place was scrubbed and we went on with our lives, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Every single day, I always come home and walk over where the blood was, and I always wonder what the heck happened in the corridor that night. Now, I was a little bit uncomfortable living here before, but now I'm definitely really spooked out. I wonder if I'll ever figure out what happened. When I was in college, I lived in apartments that weren't on campus but still called student housing. I saw this guy around that I thought was pretty cute. His name was Kiefer. He knocked on my door one day and he said he was the maintenance man and that he needed to change our AC filters. I was making dinner for my roommate at the time and for myself and he commented that it smelled really good so I invited him in to stay for dinner. All went pretty normal as we watched a movie afterwards. Totally innocent. At about midnight or so, I kept telling him that I was really tired trying to hint for him to leave. My roommate had already gone to bed, so it was just him and me now. After telling him to leave because I was going to bed, he kept trying to talk me out of it, saying that I should stay up longer. He just kept taking forever, trying to drag it out. When he was putting on his shoes, he then started crying that he had a cramp in both of his calves. He told me that he couldn't walk upstairs and that he didn't know what to do. I really wanted to go knock on his door to have his roommate come and get him, but I'm in a wheelchair and I couldn't go upstairs. We had an extra bedroom in our apartment that only had a bed in it and nothing else. He continued asking if he could sleep in the room and I kept telling him no. We argued for like 10 minutes about allowing him to sleep in the extra bedroom. I was so freaking exhausted, I just went ahead and decided to let him. I locked my roommate's door and my door so that he at least couldn't come into our rooms. When I woke up the next morning, luckily he was gone and nothing was stolen. I honestly should have reported it to the apartment complex, but I wasn't really thinking. A couple of days later, I heard someone knock on my bedroom window in the middle of the night and I totally flipped out about it. It ended up being Kiefer, but obviously I didn't let him in. Then the next night, my roommate and I were in the living room, and then he came and knocked on our door. Ashley, my roommate, answered it, and he asked for me, and she said that I was asleep already. His response? No, I know she's not asleep. I looked inside y'all's window, so I know she's awake. Yeah, Kiefer was definitely a creep. So, for some backstory... I moved from a very small town to a relatively large city. It was for university and I was around 19 years old. Since I wouldn't be in the new city until around September, my soon-to-be roommate decided to look for a place for us to live in the fall. In mid-July, she finally found us a decently priced, newly renovated, close to everything apartment. It was on a pretty busy road in the city. Fast forward to September when it was time for me to move in. Myself and my parents get to the building, and it looks a bit disheveled from the front, and upon entering, the inside of the building was an absolute mess. Appliances in the hallways, plaster was running up and down the walls like a child had been giving the material to play with, and the flooring was missing in most places. Since the apartment was actually kind of nice, and since it was my first ever apartment away from home, I was absolutely thrilled to finally have a place of my own. Now, this apartment housed many students, as well as the landlord and the superintendent, so it seemed like a relatively safe place to live, right? Wrong. My roommate had the door buzzer hooked up to her phone so that when someone rang, her phone would ring and she had the option to let them in or not. 
About a week after school had started, I was home since I didn't really have class until later in the day, and my roommate was at work. She texted me to let me know that someone had tried to buzz into the apartment, and when she answered, all she heard on the other end was an unfamiliar voice practically screaming. Let me in. Let me in right now. Luckily, my roommate had the sense enough not to let them into the building. About ten minutes later, someone comes banging right on my door. Without saying anything, they just continued knocking for what felt like hours, although it was probably only about 20 minutes in reality. I stayed in my room the entire time with the door closed because I was absolutely so afraid of who might be standing outside my door. Eventually, the knocking stopped, and when I checked the peephole, the person was gone. I felt really relieved that I had avoided what seemed to be some kind of creep looking to get in my apartment for some reason that I really wasn't aware of. Nothing too strange happened again until about two weeks later. Again, I was home since I was sick and my roommate was at work. I should note that my roommate was a flight attendant for a small airline, and obviously she wouldn't have her phone if she was already in the air. As I recall, there was no one to buzz the door this time. So it's early morning and not too long after my roommate left for work, and someone came banging on my door. Of course, I didn't get up to answer it because I was still sick in bed, hoping that they would just go away. We weren't expecting anyone, no packages or friends. And besides, how would they get into the apartment if my roommate's phone didn't ring for the door buzzer? When I finally think whoever was knocking at the door is left, someone actually unlocks the door to my apartment and walks right in. I was mortified. I always sleep with my room door closed, so there was absolutely no way that they would have known someone was in there except by opening the door. Since my roommate was a flight attendant, I knew it wasn't her because her flight would have been gone by this time, so there was really no way she could even answer her phone since there's no service when they're up in the air. I was frantically texting her to let her know that someone was indeed in our apartment without our permission. Where we live, our landlord must give 24 hours notice before entering the property. As I lay in bed crying and shaking out of pure fear, the person seemed to have just walked around the living room area and then left again. As soon as I heard the front door shut, I ran and locked all of the locks and put across the chain that would keep anyone from getting in, even if they had a key. To this day, neither me or my roommate know if it was the same person or someone who had previously lived in the apartment. We have no idea who it could have been. We left that apartment building only a couple months after that and moved into a more friendly and seemingly safer neighborhood. Whenever I drive past that building now, I always get the creeps. I don't think that I'll ever forget what happened. In Michigan, there's a little place called Traverse City. It's a smallish, very esoteric hippie kind of town. In this town, there's a bona fide abandoned mental institution, complete with an absolutely enormous deserted grounds and dilapidated buildings, an old rusty water tower, and a huge stone basin in the middle of the woods that could hold maybe about 50 people. You know, the works. This actually isn't the creepy part, believe it or not, as nothing scary really happened there. It was actually quite the popular hangout for college kids to get stoned and whatnot. It's more of a small detail on just how strange this town is, and kind of a backstory. You see, when the mental ward shut down, the patients were basically let loose to their own devices, and many of them ended up as one of the many homeless people that just roamed the town. And some of them just ended up in the Whiting. The Whiting was the cheapest apartment in town, basically a month-to-month -month hotel. It really wasn't a bad place. There was a housekeeper that stopped by once a week to clean the place up. It wasn't falling apart or infested with pests or anything. It was technically a sort of halfway home years and years ago, and it had to be shut down when some man was found dead of heroin overdose on the front steps. It eventually reopened to the public again and some of the people who lived there previously had nowhere else to go and moved back in. At this point of the story, I was a really broke college kid. I got some really weird vibes from the place, but I was really short on money, and I thought it would be an interesting experience, to say the least. Well, I wasn't wrong. First of all, it looked like the architect had actually gleaned inspiration from The Shining. Long, narrow hallways, some straight and some swooping around, 
Some that started out normal and then got so narrow that you literally had to walk sideways to fit. There was painted over doors and doors that led to nowhere, and tiny doll-sized doors in the hallway that never opened. There were a lot of creepy pictures of crying girls or off-putting abstract paintings decorating the walls. My friend lived in a small room that had a large mysterious X painted over his bed. He also had a painted over locked door to his left. And my other friend who lived on the second story at the end of the building had a window that looked out of a straight up brick wall. Pretty bizarre, right? Well, wait until you meet your neighbors. Schizophrenics and drugged out zombies wandered up and down the halls or peeked out of their doors before slamming it shut. You could just be walking along when the door would suddenly open and a battered looking woman would tell you that the other tenants were trying to hurt her and that she was going to be sleeping with a knife for protection. Another good friend of mine once opened her door and found an entire lamp taken apart piece by piece and then aligned on her doorstep. There's a few incidents that really stick out in my mind. Once I went to the shattered kitchen to make myself lasagna. One of the women was already there and she was sitting in a kitchen chair just talking to herself in a high-pitched girly voice. Now, this woman was a big and rather imposing individual, made all the more intimidating because she had a habit of ramming people in the shoulder whenever she passed them in the halls. She's just sitting there and mocking and insulting me the entire time, but all to herself as if I can't hear her, all while eyeing me with a sideways dead-eyed kind of look. Every now and then, she gives a high-pitched giggle that sounded truly sinister. Well, I then say, Uh, everything alright? And she's muttering to herself, The thing's talking to me. I won't respond. And then she giggles. I'm definitely perplexed at this point. I pick up a fork and I'm getting ready to exit, and she then starts really flipping out and starts rapidly saying, You got a fork? You gonna kill me with that? You gonna stab me in the throat and murder my family with that fork? Yes, she was actually screaming by the end of it. I didn't stick around. I could still hear her screaming whenever I would take my crap out of the door, going on about hurting her. And just like some movie, I can hear high-pitched hysterical laughter echoing down the halls as she gets louder and louder. Truly brought goosebumps up to my arms, I can tell you that. Another time, a man was so messed up on some substances that he could hardly stand and he tried to chase me. He was at the foot of the stairs and I had to pass him and he tried to slur some nonsense at me while I walked by him. I think he said something about a shower. Well, he reaches out and grabs my arm and then tries pulling me toward him. I pull away so fast that he gets knocked over and as I'm running up the stairs, he's trying to collect himself and stand back up. I hide in my friend's room and we can hear him slouching and banging up the stairs, just calling for me in a doped up sort of way. About a week later, he apparently forgets about it and I see him in the lobby. He had asked me which room I lived in. So yeah, that's a brief summary of the really creepy place that I lived in at one point. It was definitely an interesting and creepy experience to say the least. Thank you for reading my story. I must start by saying this story falls about average or maybe even below average on the scary meter. But it was such a strange event that I found it discussion worthy. So maybe some of you will rate it high on that strange meter and maybe some of you will just think it's lame. I lived in the third house at the end of a dead end road just on the outside of a small town in Ohio. Many strange and dark things happened there. Maybe I will share those stories some other time. But one night, I was left perplexed by something I saw from my bedroom window. This old house did not have central air. Although I had a window unit in my bedroom, I'd like to shut it off and open the windows on cool, breezy nights. I loved listening to the sounds of nature. Surrounding the dead-end road were many miles of woods where I would see coyotes, raccoons, possum, and deer. These were everyday sightings. There were many times throughout many nights where the woods would go silent. 
I think most of you know when the woods go silent, there is likely a predator of some kind nearby. One night, I have my windows open. It's after midnight sometime, and I'm just browsing Pinterest on my phone when the woods go silent. It seemed like it was five minutes or so before I noticed how long everything had been silent. You could even hear a pin drop. Normally, when the woods go silent, it was never for more than a couple of minutes. Being curious and wondering if coyotes were sniffing around my front porch again, I got up and looked out my bedroom window that faces the front of the house. Now, at this time I can't remember if I had started listening to these kind of podcasts or not, so I'm not sure if I had ever heard the stories of wendigos or not deer creatures. Listening to one of the Swamp Dweller podcast shows made me remember this event and realize what I saw may have been one of these creatures. For context, the road at the front of my house was paved and went straight until it wide off into our driveway to the left and the other portion went straight ahead to the right and wide turned into a dirt and gravel road. Then I looked out the window. Everything was silent and I was surprised to see what appeared to be a very large and lonely buck walking down the middle of the road towards the dirt road and straight ahead. I watched for it, finding it strange that it was all alone. Normally when you see one deer, there are at least a few close by. As I watched it walking towards the dirt road, I thought it looked strange. First off, I'll be honest, I'm no hunter, but this buck looked massive. Two or three times larger than what might be considered average. Not only was it large, but the way it walked, like it was being worked like a string puppet, or like it was in a trance, or maybe even how a soldier would march. It never turned and looked at me. I never made a sound. I just stood there, rubbing my eyes trying to figure out what the heck I was seeing. I was 100% sober during this, just a heads up. Before it reached the point where I couldn't be able to see it from my window, I looked around. I'm not sure why. Maybe I was trying to see any other deer to rationalize what this was. This was only for a second, and when I looked back, it was gone. There was no way it could have left my line of sight so quickly. That's when I that's when I realized I never heard its footsteps. It never made a sound. Just the woods came back to life right then and there, and I almost jumped out of my skin from being so spooked. I just stood at my window, feeling bewildered. What the hell did I just see? Whatever it was was definitely not a deer. This thing made the forest which was usually very loud at night, go dead quiet. The way it walked, its size, how it just disappeared. The whole situation was just so bizarre. I thought about telling my roommate what I saw, but he was not a sensitive person and not a big believer in the unknown or the paranormal. Although a year or two later, when the house was being renovated, he started to believe. But hey, that's another story entirely. So there it is, my potential not dear sighting. Like I said, it's not the scariest story, but it's a head-scratcher. Do any of you have a similar story? Can anyone tell me what they think I saw, or what they think the not-deer was doing marching down the road just to disappear? I feel like if I had made a sound or engaged with it, the situation may have escalated. I was always under the impression that there might be a portal on the property for spirits or unknown things to come and go through. Is that what the not-deer was doing? Just taking the portal back to hell for a dinner engagement with Satan. This story takes place in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. For those who are not aware, the Appalachian Mountain Range is approximately 480 million years old, and I've always wondered while hiking in the park about what kind of animals once roamed the hills we hike today. In the summertime, the dense vegetation and the abundant rhododendrons can take you back to a prehistoric age when the dinosaurs would have foraged among the same hills that hikers now casually walk, basking in the unparalleled beauty that is the Smokies. This event happened in late December, when the leaves fall off the deciduous trees, opening the hills to your eyes allowing you to see the contours of the land as you hike. Me and my girlfriend were staying in the small town of Weirs Valley, 
which is approximately 45 minutes west of the bustling tourist trap of Gatlinburg. We'd stayed in Gatlinburg in years past and decided that this year we wanted a small cabin, far from the normal hustle and bustle of the late December tourist rush. Many of the locals spitefully call this period from Christmas to New Year's Hell Week. Knowing this, we decided to stop at a small hiking store and inquired about a day hike that would take us far into the backcountry. They pulled out a map detailing the western end of the park and showed us multiple trails that would fit our description. We ended up settling on a trail that was about four miles one way, with a massive waterfall as the reward at the end of the trail. We arrived at the trailhead at about nine in the morning, and there was only about one car there already. Perfect. It was an elderly couple getting their packs ready for their hike, and we were excited at the lack of hikers. As our goal for the day was to try and not see a human being for the entire hike, the first half of the hike was entirely uneventful. We reached the waterfall after about two hours or so, and sat down and took a lunch break before departing back towards the trailhead. Before I continue the story, I want to make a note that we had not seen a single person the entire hike so far. We had not even seen so much as a plane flying overhead. That's why we turned the corner on the trail and we froze in our places. There was a girl walking alone about 50 yards ahead of us. Now, normally it's not uncommon to see people hiking alone, but they typically look the part. They usually have a hiking pack, hiking shoes, and they'll almost always acknowledge you and ask you how your day is before you go in your separate ways. N not this girl. First and foremost, she did not look like she belonged out there. She looked like she was about 15 or 16 years old, and she did not have a bag or any wash. She was about 15 or 16 wearing tennis shoes, which was odd considering that this rugged trail demanded heavy hiking boots. We were shocked to see her out this far by herself, and we were even more disturbed that we didn't see her before turning the corner on the trail. She essentially appeared out of nowhere. After me and my girlfriend exchanged concerned looks, we decided to continue down the trail as normal as we didn't want this girl to turn around and see us just standing there and spook her. We made ourselves known as best as we could by kicking rocks with our boots and talking to each other. This girl didn't turn around and acknowledge us or even respond to us one time, even when we said hello. After about 50 yards of following her at a distance, we reached a creek crossing with a rudimentary path of dry rocks as the only way to cross. She put her arms out to balance herself, and we both noticed that when she put her arms up, it didn't look right. Unless you had terrible balance, there was no reason to balance yourself on this little creek crossing. Calling it a creek is almost giving it too much credit, as it was more like a gentle stream coming off the hill that crossed the trail and flowed to the river below. The water at its deepest was no more than six inches, and if you had halfway decent hiking boots, you could simply walk through the water without getting your feet wet. Wanting to be considerate of our fellow hiker, we decided to wait behind her as she arduously crossed the creek. She took way more time than she needed to cross and it felt like she was deliberately walking slow to creep us out. We crossed the creek in about 30 seconds time after watching her take two or three minutes. Keep in mind, this creek was maybe 15 feet long at that and as I mentioned, maybe six inches deep. I decided to cross before my girlfriend because I had a nauseating feeling in the pit of my stomach about the entire situation and I wanted to put something between her and my girlfriend. Because I had my eyes glued on this girl, I wasn't paying attention to where I was walking and my foot slipped from the rock and fell into the water, making a very loud splash. Even though this girl was less than 20 feet ahead of us, she still did not turn around and acknowledge us. After me and my girlfriend crossed the creek, we could see that shortly ahead were a set of switchbacks going down the mountain. We decided to stop and put some distance between us and the girl. She was walking at an incredibly slow pace, and we waited for a couple of minutes before we saw that she had gone around the corner down the first switchback. Me and my girlfriend had a brief conversation about what the heck just happened, and we collected ourselves and continued down the trail. We didn't think anything much of it, we just tried to continue going without being unnerved any further. We thought that was the case, and so, when we turned down the first switchback and saw something terrible, well, we saw nothing at all. The girl had vanished. 
unless she took off at a sprint as soon as she turned the corner. We should have seen her. The switchback was very gradual, and we could clearly see the next five or six switchbacks below us. The leaves were gone off the trees, allowing us to see every foot of the trail below. Even if she started running, we would have heard her. The main river was about 500 feet below us, and the rushing water was barely audible from where we were standing. She either vanished, hid behind a tree from us, or somehow managed to sprint a quarter mile down the mountain in complete silence away from us. We had absolutely no idea what to think, so we once again stopped to collect ourselves. We were terrified and were not sure whether to go back up the mountain or continue down as planned. After a hurried deliberation, we decided to proceed down the trail as normal. We never saw her. As we reached the trailhead, we ran into a group of hikers and we figured we'd ask them if they saw a teenage girl hiking along without a backpack. They gave us a strange look and said we were the first people they'd seen on the trail all day. We simply thanked them and continued as to not scare them. I've always heard of paranormal things happening in the Smokies, from Bigfoot to Skimwalkers to a group of wild mountain people living primitively within the park. I've always entertained these stories because who doesn't love a good ghost story? I've never anticipated having an encounter of my own in the woods. The scariest thing to me about the encounter all these years later, though, is that we never saw her face. Before my husband and I got married, we were living together in a mediocre apartment complex in a similarly mediocre part of the city. Now, it wasn't an especially dangerous place, but security at the complex was severely lacking. For context, I once had my car stolen right out of the parking lot in broad daylight without anyone noticing. Another issue with the complex's parking lot was its shortage of spaces. This was usually more of an annoyance than anything, but on one occasion, it had put me in very real danger. I was still finishing my degree at the time, and I had night classes that, in combination with an hour and a half commute, left me getting home on most nights well after 11 p.m. Often I was lucky enough to find a space in the main parking lot by my building, but there were a few occasions when I found myself having to park in a much farther lot. The slot was very poorly lit, it had no buildings near it, and usually had very few cars in it. It was creepy in and of itself, but what really scared me about it was the extended walk from it. As a 21-year-old woman, I had already had plenty of experience with creeps, late-night walks, and unpleasant combinations of the two, but usually those walks were down a street or somewhere more public. Walking alone through this big, dark, empty lot really made me feel like sitting prey. No one had noticed when someone stole my car in the middle of the day, why should I expect anyone to notice if something happened to me there in the middle of the night? With all this going through my head most nights to begin with, there was one evening in particular when getting out of my car just felt like a really bad idea. Now, I'm not a superstitious person, but my intuition was buzzing from the very minute that I unlocked my door. I had only taken a few steps when I had spotted a man standing stock still right by the dumpster near my building. He didn't have any trash, he wasn't looking through it. He wasn't smoking. He wasn't doing anything. He was just standing there looking at me. I was still all the way across the parking lot, but other than getting back in my car, there was no way around him. The dumpster was squarely in the middle of the two entrances to my building, so no matter which way I went, I'd have to walk directly toward him. My keys were already between my fingers, but I wasn't feeling very confident about whether this would help or not. I'm not a strong person, and I'm also only about 5 foot 3. More than anything, I felt silly for being so afraid, but I knew in my gut something was wrong. This man had appeared out of nowhere. I'd driven past the dumpster on my way into the lot, and he hadn't been there. Also, I knew what everyone in my building had looked like, and there's absolutely no way that he would have had time to get there from another building between when I passed the dumpster and when I parked. As I got closer, it became increasingly obvious that I wasn't imagining the man staring at me. Especially because, as I got closer, he turned his body so that he was always facing me. Kind of like a sunflower. Just rotating in place, always watching me. Then came the moment when I had to pass him to get to the door. I felt really silly doing it, 
but I turned around and walked half backwards as I got close to passing him. I left a really wide space between us as I drew near by walking in the grass instead of on the sidewalk, but I still didn't want to turn my back on him. Eventually though, I had to, and the second I did, I heard footsteps. Not just footsteps, but running footsteps. They were coming toward me, and really fast. So I ran too. I sprinted to the building, ran up the steps to the door, entered the pen as quickly as I could, and then hoped to hell that he wouldn't be able to follow me. I didn't stop running until I got to my apartment door, three flights of stairs later. My neighbors were probably pissed about the noise, but I was terrified. The second I got in the door, I told my then fiance everything that happened between panic breaths, and he immediately called security. While he did, I went to go peek through the balcony window to see if I could spot the man. I couldn't. He was nowhere to be seen. When security finally arrived, they reported the same. No one was around. I still have no idea what the man was doing there before I got there or where he came from, and I've moved across town since then, but to that really creepy guy from my apartment parking lot. I really, really hope to never encounter you ever again. For a long time, just about every day on my way to work, I would stop at Dunkin' Donuts and get some coffee. I've been doing this for a while, and I'd stop at the drive-thru and pick it up. A while ago, I went there one day to the same location that I always did. It's close to my house and on the way to work, right before I get onto the freeway. One morning it was just like any other. I got ready for work, left my house, and then went to Dunkin'. When I got to the drive-thru, it was busy like usual. Eventually, I placed my order and got around to the window and paid. When I was there, they told me to pull around and park in the parking lot, and they would bring my drink out to me shortly. This was strange. I had never had to do this before, especially because I just got one drink and not a huge order. I drove and found an open parking space in the front of the building. I was thinking maybe they ran out of one of the ingredients in my drink and had to get more or something like that. I waited for a few minutes and was just browsing my phone. Then finally, I saw somebody approach my driver's window. They weren't carrying a coffee, though. I rolled down my window to them. It was a guy with long hair and a black shirt. I thought he worked at Duncan at first because of his shirt, and he also had a Duncan hat on, but the man just stood there and stared at me. I rolled down my window and asked him what was going on. The man stood there staring at me for a moment, then said in a loud voice to get out of the car. My instincts were telling me to leave, so I backed out. The man just stared at me as I did and watched me leave. I drove away and went to work without getting coffee. The next day, I saw that the Duncan location was closed, and when I looked online, it said temporarily closed, but I couldn't find any information as to why. After that, I started going to another place for coffee in the morning instead. to work at a Dunkin' Donuts about three or four years ago. I only worked there for about three months, and the job wasn't really for me. When I worked there, I would do a little bit of everything, and was often helping people in the drive through One day when I was working, a man came through the drive through and ordered a coffee. When he got to the window and I handed it to him, he asked me for my number, and he seemed sort of creepy. I told the man no, but tried to be nice to him. He seemed a lot older than me, was a big guy with a slight beard and brownish hair that was messy. The guy said okay to me and then left. Things like this didn't happen often, but would occasionally, and normally it wasn't a big deal. But later in that day, the man came back. It was about two hours later, and he walked inside the restaurant this time. I had moved to working near the front counter, and didn't even remember him at first because of how busy we had been. It wasn't as busy now, though, as it was later and the man came up to the counter and asked me if I remembered him. At that point is when I did, and he started talking to me, asking me if I wanted to go out with him. I told him that I was working and I didn't want to. I then told him I didn't have time to talk, and if he wasn't going to order anything, I had to help the next person in line. He then put his hands up and said, all right, and then started to walk away. It was the afternoon now, and we closed at 8 p.m., so I only had a few hours left. I got back to work, didn't see the man again during my shift. 
the last hour was very quiet, and as the sun set and it got dark out, we would rarely get very many customers. My coworker Anna went to sweep the floors of the restaurant, which is something that we usually did shortly before closing. I started to do some cleaning behind the counters. Anna came back a few minutes later and said to me that there was a guy who seemed to be pacing and walking around the parking lot. There were no other cars there other than ours, and she mentioned how it seemed a little weird because he kept looking over. I came out from behind the counter and looked out the window. It was the same man who had talked to me two times earlier that day. I told Anna this, and we both figured that he knew we were closing and was waiting for me to leave. We both were very concerned, and I decided to call my dad. Luckily, we lived only a few miles away, and it wasn't too far of a drive. My dad said he would be there soon, and when he arrived, he was able to pick me up right outside the door so I didn't have to talk to the man. He drove Anna and I to our cars, which were at the other end of the parking lot, but we didn't have to deal with the guy who was being extremely creepy. When we all left, we saw the guy just standing in the middle of the parking lot watching us. I didn't work at Duncan much longer after that, and never worked another closing shift or saw the man again, luckily but I do wonder what would have happened if I had walked to my car by myself that night. About five years ago, I finally went to Dunkin' Donuts for my first time ever. I'd been meaning to go there for years and always known it was popular, but I never got around to it until then. I went to one on the other side of town and walked inside. It was the morning, and I could see that it was really busy because there was a lot of people in line. I got to the back of the line and waited. The line slowly moved forward, and I noticed that a man got in line behind me. The man was standing uncomfortably close to me, and I turned around to see that it was a really tall guy with sunglasses on and a black coat. It was awkward, because when the line would move up, I would move farther away from him, and then he would keep getting closer. He always stood a really close distance from me. Finally, when it was my turn to order, I got a couple of donuts to try them and see how they were. After I ordered it, it was the weird guy's turn, but I noticed that he didn't go up to the counter and order, he just stood there, and then when I left, he followed me out the door. With the sunglasses on, I couldn't really get a good look at the guy, and I didn't know what his deal was, but I walked back to my car in the parking lot and got inside. Thankfully, the guy didn't follow me, and I watched him walk to a car a few spaces away. I got out the donuts and was eating them in my car. I noticed that the guy got in the driver's seat of his car, which just looked like a regular silver car. And then he started watching me with his sunglasses still on. This was starting to become really weird, so I decided it was best to leave. I put the second donut away, and just as I was about to back out of the parking space that I was in, I saw the silver car that the guy was in start to move. I was hoping he would leave, so I waited there, but instead, he backed out of his space and kept moving backwards until his car was completely blocking mine from leaving. Then, I watched the man exit his car and walk over to the back of mine. It looked like he took a photo of my license plate and then touched the back of my car. Then he got back inside of his car and drove away. After this, I drove home, hoping that the guy wasn't secretly following me or anything like that. I don't think he was, and I got home just fine. I was wondering the whole time exactly what he was doing back there and why he would take a picture of my license plate. Then I went to go inside and as I passed by the back side of my car, I noticed that where the man had touched my car, there appeared to be some sort of bumper sticker. I looked at it and saw that it didn't have any writing on it. I picked it off my car because I didn't want it on there and went to throw it away. Then I saw that on the other side, it said, I'm watching you. It looked like it had been written in Sharpie. I threw it in the garbage and went inside. After that, I never saw the guy again, but I wonder sometimes if he was actually stalking me or if he got me confused with somebody else. I work at a Dunkin' Donuts. I've been working there for roughly a year. The craziest thing that's happened so far was about four months ago. I typically work opening shifts. We open at 6 a.m., so I get there long before that and help with getting things ready before we open. We make donuts and do more preparing and things like that. One morning, I was the first one to arrive. There's usually a few of us working, but when I got inside, I turned on a light in the back. I began to get a few things ready and wait for some of my coworkers to show up and help. I then 
heard a noise come from the back area where there were a bunch of boxes and things like that. I guessed I wasn't alone, and one of my coworkers was there after all. I called out hey, but didn't get a response. I sat there in silence for a few minutes. Then, when I finally moved again, I thought I heard another noise come from back there. That's when I decided to investigate. I walked back to the boxes, and there were a lot of them. This was in the very back area, and none of us went over here very often. I looked around, and it was mostly dark, and I didn't see anything at all. Then, I thought I heard a very small noise. I walked farther back and looked behind one of the larger boxes. That's when I saw a man crouched behind it, looking at me. This was probably the last thing that I was expecting to see, and I jumped back in shock. He didn't work there, and I had no idea who he was. I started walking back quickly when I heard him start to get up, and I started running at that point. I then heard the man let out a loud yell, almost a scream. He wasn't saying anything, but just screaming, basically. I ran to the bathroom and locked myself inside. Thankfully, it was a whole room for the bathroom, and not just some stalls, so the man couldn't get inside. The man tried opening the door, but couldn't get in. I then heard him walk away. I got out my phone and started to call the police, but just then, I heard the front door open and a woman scream. This was my coworker Sydney, who was arriving to work. I opened the bathroom door up and saw the man running from in front of the counter to behind it. Then I saw Sydney standing in the entrance of the doorway. She then turned and ran back outside into the parking lot. I used this opportunity to run to the door and leave the building as well. The man was somewhere in the back again, and Sydney and I called the police and waited in our cars for them to arrive. When they did, they were able to go inside and get the man. I don't know how he got inside, but I guess he must have found his way in the previous night and hid when we closed. If you really like my content and want to support me, please like this video and click the subscribe button. It helps me to grow my channel as essential in reaching a wider audience. Most of you watching my videos aren't subscribed to my channel, and that's why my animations can't reach their full potential. They aren't recommended to more people who would surely love my content as much as you do. You can always unsubscribe at any moment. Thank you in advance, and enjoy the rest of the video. Several years ago, I used to live sort of near a dollar store. It was about 10 minutes away from my apartment, and slightly closer than most of the other stores in the shopping area that was nearby. I really didn't go there much, but I occasionally would to get certain products. One night, I decided to go out and get a birthday card for my sister because it was her birthday later that week. I figured the best deal would be at the dollar store, so I drove there. The dollar store was called Dollar Tree, and I walked inside to see that they did in fact have a really good selection of birthday cards inside. The store wasn't too busy, and I was able to look through a bunch of cards before I finally found one that I liked for my sister. After I got it, I walked over and checked out with the cashier, then left the store. I walked out to my car in the quiet, dark parking lot, then got inside my SUV and started to drive away. I had my music going like I always did, which was connected to my phone through Bluetooth. But about halfway home, I thought I heard a strange noise. I turned down my music and listened. I didn't hear anything for a few seconds. But then I heard it again. It was coming from the back of my car. I looked behind me. I saw in the far back of my car, behind the second row of seats, the head of a man emerged, and I was looking right at his face for a good second. I screamed and immediately pulled the car over to the side of the road. I'm not sure why I did that, but I was purely reacting to the situation. Unfortunately, I was driving down a quiet road on the way back home. There were really no places I could go to. It was pretty much just woods and fields on both sides. Once my car was pulled over, I did have the presence of mind to take the keys out, and when I got out and off the road, I went into the woods. I took off running, and as I did, I heard the back of my car start to swing open. I looked, and just for another second, I saw a man running into the woods towards me. The man was wearing a black sweatshirt with the hood up and jeans. I turned away after seeing him, and it made me run faster. I had a good 40 or 50 feet on him, and I dodged tree branches and ran into a bunch of bushes and tall grass and things like that. I was running fast, and I had no idea where I was going, but I could hear the man running behind me. He didn't really seem to be getting closer, though, and eventually I heard him less and less. I 
slowly turned my sprint into a jog. Then I noticed something in the distance. It was a house. The house had a light on, and I ran to the front door and started pounding on it. I didn't see the man behind me, and I was hoping he wouldn't catch up. I kept knocking on the door, and after like 30 seconds, it finally opened. A woman opened the door, and I told her what had happened. She didn't want to let me in her house, though. I'm not sure if she believed my story and thought I was a creep or something. I couldn't really blame her, and she was about to close her door in my face when I asked her if she could just call the police for me. She agreed to do that and called the police. I waited near her house, constantly looking at the entrance of the woods in case the man would return. Eventually, the police arrived, and I told them the whole story. We all went back to my car, which was still on the side of the road with the back of it wide open. They didn't find the man, so I guess he ran away somewhere. Whoever that guy was must have snuck in my car when I was in the Dollar Tree. I guess it was unlocked or something. I'm not sure if he was planning to attack me or what, but I'm glad I saw him when I did. I used to work at a dollar store. I was a cashier, but we never really got too busy, so it wasn't uncommon for me to do other stuff around the place. Typically, on weeknights, there were just a few of us working, and sometimes just one. One night, I was working with just my coworker until she left at 9 o'clock because the place was already super quiet and we closed at 10. I agreed to close the place up, and it was an easy hour where I rang up a couple of customers, and then there were no customers in the place at all. I left my register to sweep the floor nearby and hoped nobody else would come in this door for the remaining 20 minutes that we were open. I was almost done sweeping when I heard the front doors to the store opening up. I looked and saw a man wearing a dark blue jacket and baseball cap walk inside. He immediately turned to the right and went behind an aisle out of my view. I finished up my sweeping of the floor and then walked back over to my register to be ready for when the man would check out. Time went by and then I announced over the store speaker that we would be closing in 10 minutes. I once again repeated that when we were closing in 5. I looked around the aisles that I could see, but I didn't see the man at all. When it was 10 o'clock, I announced that we were now closed, and he had to come up to the cash register and check out. I waited a couple of minutes, but there was still nothing. I then walked over and locked the entrance door so nobody else would come inside. Then I decided to walk through the store and see where this man was. I went down the first aisle, and he wasn't there. I then went down a few more, but couldn't find him. Finally, I'd been around basically the entire store, and then realized he must have gone to the bathroom. We had our bathrooms in the back corner of the store near the employee break room, and there was a back room there as well where we had extra merchandise. I walked towards there, and as soon as I made it to the little hallway area that was back there, I saw him. It looked like he was almost hiding behind the door that led to our back room. As soon as I saw him, he darted from behind there and ran to the main area of the store. I walked out hoping to see him leave, but I didn't hear him leaving. Instead, I heard movement towards the middle of the store. Then, suddenly, I saw a man jump out from behind another aisle and throw a glass cup at me. I was able to move out of the way and dodge it just in time. I walked back around the side of the store and away from the man and made my way back to the front. I yelled that the man needed to leave now or I was calling the police. I didn't know what his problem was, but he was acting really strange. I didn't hear him leaving, though. I wasn't sure if this guy was insane or what. Then I heard a loud crash come from the area where he was. Now I knew I needed to call the police. But before I could, I heard more noises and watched the man run out of the store. After he had left, I wanted to run over to the door and lock it. But as I was on the way there, I saw him run back inside. He ran out of my sight again. I decided it was best for my safety if I just left the store. So I ran outside, then called the police. I waited inside my car, and eventually they arrived. The police came and went. The police went inside the store and were able to get the man. When I went back inside, I saw all the damage that he caused. He made quite a mess, and I stayed late to clean it up. I was just happy everyone was okay. I think the guy was on drugs, or else he was just insane. A few years back, when I had recently graduated from high school, I was hanging out with my friend Josh at his house. We played video games until like 10 o'clock at night or so, then I got tired and went back to my place. I 
lived only a few blocks away, so I had walked there from my parents' house. As I was on my way back, I passed by this little dollar store that was in town. I was pretty thirsty, so I walked around to the front and went inside to get something to drink. I hadn't actually been to this store before, but I had drove and walked past it all the time. It just looked a little cheap and run down to me. When I got inside the place, it didn't seem very nice. It was sort of cluttered and old looking. Nobody else was in there though, so I walked right over to the fridge, grabbed a drink, and then made my way to the register. It seemed strange in there, because half of the lights were off, and when I got to the register, there was nobody there. I looked around wondering where the employees were. I seemed to be the only person in the entire store at all. I looked behind the counter and nobody was there. I set my drink near the register and then took a few steps away. Just then, I heard a voice come from behind me. I looked back over at the counter and there was now a tall man standing there. He asked me if I was ready to check out. I jumped when I saw him. It was like he had just suddenly appeared. There wasn't a back room right behind the counter that he could have come from and I had looked behind it before and if he was ducking below it, I would have seen him there as well. I just said yes and then paid for my drink. I then started to walk away. I looked back once again, but the man was now gone. Nobody was behind the counter. I was so confused and I don't know what happened. I felt kind of creeped out by the whole thing. I started just walking home and looked back one last time. I now saw the man standing outside the store about 10 feet from the door, just staring at me. It really gave me the creeps, and I walked faster and went the rest of the way home. It was one of the strangest experiences of my life. I later found out that the store closed at 9 every night, and I had gone there way past 10 p.m. That just makes it even weirder. My daughter asked me if I wanted to share one or two personal experiences I've had as a police officer. She's a cop too and seems to think that they may go some way in humanizing us in the eyes of our detractors. I have my doubts, but it's important to her, so I agree to do it. So you may understand my way of seeing things, I'll give you a bit of background before I retired. I grew up middle class in the Midwest of America. After a few years of college, I quit and joined the army. Soon after I enlisted, Iraq invaded Kuwait and we were sent to dry them out. I didn't see much combat, thank God. After my enlistment ended, I got out and enrolled in the police training program. I graduated that and became a street cop. The majority of my career was spent on the streets until I retired a couple of years ago. These days, I earn my daily bread as a gunsmith, and that's about the lot of it. The story I'm telling today started not long after I got my first assignment. I answered a call at a supermarket. The female manager met me at the front doors and informed me that a man was bothering customers. I walked around the store until I came across a disheveled middle-aged man. He was talking to a pair of teenage girls. They were visibly distressed, so I approached and told the girls that they could leave. Without blinking, the male turned to me and continued his conversation. He wasn't aggressive or loud, but you could tell from his body language and behavior that he clearly had some sort of mental illness. I asked him some questions and he answered politely. I mentioned that some people had complained about him. His only reply was, okay. He apparently lived nearby with his sister. Unsure of what to do, I thought for a minute and suggested that he may want to return home in case she was looking for him. This tact seemed to have worked as he said okay again and headed toward the front. I followed him alongside, continuing to make small talk. Everything was going well until he noticed the manager standing nearby and unexpectedly blew up on her. I approached him and inquired what was wrong. He pointed at her and said she was a bad person, a mean person, he yelled. I suggested that he'd be happier if he left the store where she couldn't bother him, and he agreed. We stood out front and talked a few more minutes until he said that he had to leave. I said goodbye and watched him walk off until he disappeared behind a gas station. I re-entered the store and spoke to the manager one final time. I explained the situation and she looked to be relieved. 
and with all parties satisfied, I headed back to my cruiser to finish my shift and do a bit of write-ups. I assumed the problem had been resolved and put the call out of my mind. A few weeks went by and I got another call to the market. It was a near-carbon copy of the first. On this occasion, I came across Barry. I forgot to mention his name earlier in the story, as he had a young man cornered near the pharmacy. I believed he was talking about Henry kissing her when I walked up. It was really weird. The poor kid had no clue what he was talking about. As before, I interjected so the kid could escape. I took advantage of our prior meeting and again convinced Barry that he may be needed at home. He agreed, and this time, I figured I could just let him walk out unaccompanied. And this was a rookie mistake. A minute hadn't passed, and I heard him yelling at somebody. I figured it was the manager, and I was right. I stepped between them, and Barry soon lost interest. No further talk was needed to get him to leave after that. I was beginning to wonder why he hated this woman so much when he was so friendly to complete strangers. I asked if he and her had any previous history, but... She couldn't remember ever seeing him until recently, and I'll never claim to know what's going on in the head of a crazy person. Maybe he just hated her face. Who knows? Over the next several months, Barry became a regular source of problems not only for the store, but for me. At least twice a week, I would get called about him. Not always from the store, but it was the store from where the friction occurred and made my job that much harder. I became so desperate to solve this problem I met with his sister. I'd hoped that between the two of us, we'd be able to find a solution. Unfortunately, she had a load of problems of her own. She was clearly battling some painful and degenerative disease. She was in no state to be dealing with her brother. I left their house feeling disappointed and honestly even more hopeless. Not long after that visit, something changed in Barry. His aggressive attitude toward the manager escalated drastically. On one call to the store, I was met outside by the woman in question, and she was a mess. Barry had approached her out of nowhere and started cursing and even threatening to kill her. He'd already left the store before I arrived, so I didn't get to talk to him. This incident made me even more determined to solve the problem peacefully once and for all. Something told me bad things were ahead. After several meetings with his caseworker, we came to the consensus that Barry may need to be institutionalized, at least temporarily. We were actually waiting for all the specifics to be resolved when he took his vendetta all the way to the end. If I recall right, it had been around a week since I'd had any Barry-related calls. The opportunity to experience new and varied crimes were a welcome change, I was nearing the end of my shift one night when I heard the all-too-familiar address come across the radio, but this time something was very different. There had been reports of gunshots from a few homeowners nearby, but there had also been a call from a female stating that she had been attacked outside the store and was forced to shoot the assailant. I took the call and hurried to the scene. When my backup and I arrived, I could see the manager sitting on the curb alongside a male I didn't recognize. The manager was bawling her eyes out. The man appeared to be attempting to comfort her. A piece of fabric was wrapped around the man's forearm. It looked to be lightly stained with a red substance, probably blood. What I saw next made my heart sink. Illuminated in my headlights before me lay the body of a male, and that male was Barry. We exited our cruisers and began our work. According to the manager, she and her fellow employee had stayed over after the store closed to do the usual paperwork. The gentleman was walking her to her car when Barry appeared from the bushes and began ranting at her as usual. Only this time, he was waving a knife around. The male employee tried to de-escalate the encounter only to get a slash across his arm for his trouble, and this is when the female manager drew her gun from her purse and fired on Barry six times. He had unfortunately passed before we arrived. In her statement, she said after he began threatening her, she bought a pistol and took a self-defense class. And I really don't blame her. Barry's behavior was becoming very menacing near the end. It was a very sad situation all around, but she'd done everything legally and there was no grounds to prosecute. She was clearly traumatized by taking a life as you would expect. The saddest part of this all was what we would discover later. 
Barry had apparently stopped taking his meds around the time I first encountered him. This was the most probable reason for his downhill slide. I did get to speak to his sister on one more occasion. She indicated that he would occasionally fixate on a single person, and this person was usually a stranger in a position of power. In certain instances, he would stop taking his medication, this would be amplified. In the past, she had been able to get him to return to his pills and the trouble would stop. Sadly, this time she had been distracted with her own health battle and missed the signs. And I don't blame her either. The truth is, no one should be saddled with the care of someone like Barry. In this case, it truly does take a village. Out of all the things I saw and dealt with in my career, what occurred in those few months involving Barry have stuck with me ever since. The way in which I interacted with suspects, how I handled unknown situations, all of it grew out of how things played out in his case. His death made me a better cop, believe it or not. I realize that may sound odd, but I assure you it's true. I was determined to avoid similar results in the future. The citizens I interacted with weren't always happy with my decisions, but it kept people safe and that's all that mattered to me at the end of the day. What I've written here is the bulk of what occurred in that case. There may be a few facts I chose to leave out, but the idea is still the same. When my little girl came to me with this idea, I was not only skeptical, but more than reticent to share personal aspects of my career. This story in particular doesn't portray me in a very professional light. I don't think most cops would like people to know just how clueless we all are at the start of our career. Initially, I planned on writing about another case, but then realized this story was perfect for what my daughter had envisioned. As for if I actually achieve what I set out to do, that's up to the readers to determine. I did my best, not being a professional writer and on, I hope what I was trying to say came across clearly enough. I've definitely rattled on much longer than necessary, and although I have a lot more I'd like to include, I'll just end here. <laughs>